Hello, and I would like to welcome you to this virtual uh, planning meeting on the 7th of April. My name is Councillor Sally Davis, and as Vice Chair, I'm chairing the meeting today in the absence of Councillor Matt McCabe, who is not well. So on behalf of all involved with planning, councillors and officers, I wish him a speedy recovery. And although if he's watching this on YouTube today, I'm not so sure that will help his way to recovery, but we do wish you well and hope you'll join us again soon, Matt. I will now call out the names of the other members of the committee who will be making the decisions today and ask them to confirm that they are present. Councillor Rob Appleyard. Present. Councillor Vic Clark. Present. Councillor Sue Craig. Present. Councillor Lucy Hodge. Present. Councillor Duncan Hounsell. Present. Councillor Sean Hughes. Present. Councillor Eleanor Jackson. Present. Councillor Hal McPhee. Present. And Councillor Amanda Rigby. Present. Also present today are Simon Ellis, the legal advisor. Chris yeah. Gon, the planning yeah. team manager. Sorry, Simon. Uh, Chris Gon, the planning team manager. Morning. And Marie Todd, Democratic Services Officer. Good morning. Uh, the planning case officers are also in attendance to present their reports and answer questions along with the Highways Officer, Darren Cox. This meeting is being held under the Co Coronavirus Regulations 2020 and has the same status and valid validity as any meeting held in the Guildhall. The following applications will be considered in the morning session, and they are the Cedar Park Care Centre in Bath and 30A Lincoln Hill, Bath. The following applications will be considered this afternoon um, meeting starting at two o'clock. 138 Wells Road, Bath, and Crewcroft Barn, Hinton Charterhouse. Can I uh, now ask Marie for any apologies for absence and substitutions? Thank you, Chair. Yes, as you mentioned, I have apologies from Councillor Matt McCabe, who's being substituted by Councillor Rob Appleyard. Thank you. And are there any declarations of interest? Councillor Appleyard? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, it's in relation to the first item, Cedar Care. Um, I was involved in the original decision of this, uh, this site. And although I don't feel that there's any conflict in that area, and I would make, a, obviously, an on-balance decision, I also am Cabinet Member for Adult Care. And as such, we commission services through or with um, CEDAR Care. And as such, although I still feel that I could be very neutral in this situation, I have to think of the public perception. So on the basis of that, I will withdraw from the item and ask that I'm actually put in the waiting room for the duration of that particular decision. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other declarations of interest? No. Um, there is no urgent uh, business agreed by myself. Items from the public statements and questions. Uh, Marie will explain how the public speaking system works now. Members of the public and parish councillors have registered to speak about individual planning applications on the agenda. Ward councillors not on the committee have also indicated they wish to speak about applications. Speakers will be called to speak immediately after the case officer has made their presentation about the application. The order of speakers and the time allowed for speaking will be as follows. Parish town council representatives will speak first and will be allowed three minutes in total. Objectors to an application will be allowed three minutes in total. Supporters of an application will be allowed three minutes in total. If there is more than one objector or supporter of an application, they must share the three minutes allowed to each side. Ward councillors not on the committee who have indicated they wish to speak about an application may do so for a maximum of five minutes per application. I will time the speeches and inform the chair using the chat function when the time is up. The chair will then ask speakers to immediately conclude their remarks. After making their statement, speakers will remain in the meeting so they can observe the debate. However, they have no further right to speak and so should mute their microphone and switch off their video. They should not make any comment using the chat function. Once the item is finished, speakers will be removed from Zoom and can watch the remainder of the meeting on YouTube if they wish. Thank you. Um, and then next is the uh, minutes of the previous meeting on the 10th of March. Now they've been circulated. Can they be approved, please, as a correct record? I'll Councilor move there. I'll move there a correct record, Chair. 
And Councillor Rigby, seconding. Thank you. I think that's um, proposed and seconded, so those minutes are um, approved. Which takes us on to the main plans list. And the first one is the Cedar Park Care Centre. So I think Rob wants to be removed for that. And I'll invite Sam to present her report. Thank you, Chair. Sam Mason is the officer. Thank you. I will uh, just share my screen, so just bear with me one moment. Okay, hopefully you can see my screen now. Um, so, yeah. thank you. Um, so just to begin, um, I've got a verbal update. Um, 24 additional objections have been received um, to the scheme following the written committee report. These raise points similar to those previous objections um, and summary of them is as follows. Scale massing um, increased concerns, out of character, including the roof, um, the impact on St. Bath's Church, um, traffic impact, overdevelopment of the site, misleading information submitted, elevated uh, location concerns and the views of it, overlooking concerns, impact to outlook, concerns with noise, traffic, congestion and parking, subsistence concerns, harm to the residential amenity of Fern Cottage, general highways impacts and pedestrian safety, biodiversity loss, um, need now reduced due to care home deaths across the district from coronavirus, no evidence um, submitted to show the orchard wing closure, pa planning balance incorrectly weighted, um, harm to the conservation area listed building and fern cottage and garden house described as heritage buildings, and the public benefits are not being considered to outweigh the harm. Additionally, a further objection has been received from the Bath Preservation Trust, who considered that the harm to the list of building and conservation area is also not outweighed by the public benefits. Okay, so moving on to my presentation. Um, this is a joint planning application and listed building consent related to Cedar Park Care Centre and is for the demolition of ex existing extensions to the listed building on the site and their replacement with the erection of single and two storey extensions, along with some internal alterations and in landscaping. Just by way of background, members may remember that previous schemes have been submitted for similar development on the site. A 2017 application and listed building consent was permitted by committee and subsequently quashed by judicial review. The scheme was then redetermined and refused due to the resulting harm to the listed building and conservation area, as well as on landscape grounds. This application is a resubmission which seeks to address the problems identified in the previous proposal. So, Moving on to the site location plan on the left of the screen. The site is located in Oldfield Park, shown here edged in red. Oldfield Road bounds the site to the north. Oldfield Lane is to the west and Walnut Drive is to the rear. The site is located in a mainly residential area within the conservation area and World Heritage Site. To the right is an aerial location plan where you can see the surrounding built form of the city. So this is the existing site plan. The site is formed of essentially three elements of built form. The listed villas to the front north of the site, the central link building as it's known, um, and the southern rear building known as the orchard wing. So just for context, this is the site plan of the 2017 refuse scheme. You can see the um, proposal in green. And this is the proposed site plan. You can see the red dotted line indicates the existing built form. The proposal follows a similar footprint in terms of the central and southern elements, albeit a larger footprint. Next, we move on to the floor plans. So this is the existing lower ground floor plan and the proposed floor plan. 
Um, you probably can't see the detailed really clearly um, on this PowerPoint presentation, um, but the um, intern there have been internal improvements to the plan form of the listed building. Um, the new central and southern elements will accommodate bedrooms, mainly along um, with some ancillary accommodation. The proposal will provide 49 bed spaces overall at the site. You can also see on the proposed plans the uh, single storey glazed link which joins the listed building to the proposed accommodation. Next is the proposed ground floor um, and the existing. You can see that the central element will be part single storey and part two storey. The single storey element will be finished with the green roof. Additionally, the rear unsightly external staircase is now also removed. Um, next is the <clears throat> proposed uh, first floor plans um, and again the existing. This pertains to the uh, listed building, um, the, the main building. <clears throat> again, there will be some internal alterations here to the plan form. You can also see more clearly here the roof form of the proposed extensions. And then finally for floor plans, we have the second floor plan, which also just pertains to the listed building and some internal plan form changes. So moving on to the elevations, these are the existing elevations. The top shows the front northern elevation as it appears from the street, Oldfield Road. Below is the west side elevation, as if you were looking in the direction from Oldfield Lane. This is the rear southern elevation and the east elevation as existing. <coughs> So here we have the proposed west elevation on the top of the screen. You can see the outline of the existing building shown in red. The single storey element of the proposed central link follows the height of the existing single storey, stepping up to two storey towards the west of the site. This is joined by a glazed link to the southern element, which replaces the existing orchard wing set down from the overall height of the existing building. The east elevation again shows the outline of the existing in red. And here you can see more clearly the level changes across the site. So this slide shows the refused 2017 scheme. Um, this is the west elevation. You can see it was proposed to be joined to the main building with a two-storey link and the entire scheme was um, two-storey, taller than um, the orchard wing just and obviously more extensive built form to the bottom south of the site there. So next we have the proposed south elevations. The top is the rear. Again, the red line shows the existing building outline. The bottom drawing is the um, south section taken from within the site. And then again, for context, these are the refuse plans which show the southern elevations um, extended out from the existing orchard wing with the variety of heights and the elements proposed in the southern corner. These are the proposed um, northern sections, so they're taken from within the site. The top shows the central building in the foreground and the southern building washout in the background. The bottom drawing shows the extent of the southern building and the glazed link where it will be joined to the central building. So these are wider street scene elevations. Um, the top is again looking west. You can see the dwellings of Oldfield Road on the left and Fern Cottage and Garden House to the right. Below is the south elevation 
The buildings shown to the right are the rear elevations of those dwellings along First Avenue. These are some 3D illustrations of the proposal looking from various angles. I'll just pause here for you to take a view. Obviously, they're sort of bird's eye views. <coughs> Then we have the proposed landscape plan. Five trees are to be removed as a result of the scheme. However, 13 replacement trees will be planted along with other landscaping across the site. The landscaping now results in a more coherent and connected amenity space for the residents. You can see 15 parking spaces are retained at the site along with cycle stands. The Western access will also be widened slightly. So finally, we move on to a few slides of photos. So here, the top left shows the front street facing elevation and entrance. The top right shows the side of the site beginning to look down towards Oldfield Lane. You can see the orchard wing just in the background there. Um, the bottom left is taken from within the site, looking towards the orchard wing. Um, and the bottom right is also taken from within the site looking towards the listed building element. The top left of uh, this slide is taken, um, is the rear of the site looking towards the rear elevation of um, Fern Cottage. The top right is taken from within the southeast corner of the site looking at the existing orchard wing. Um, the bottom left is taken from a rear garden of a property south of Walnut Drive, looking at the existing south elevation. And the bottom left is taken from Walnut Drive, looking at the rear of the site and Fern Cottage. Okay, um, and then here the top left photo is taken from Oldfield Lane. And the top right, again, is taken from the corner of Oldfield Lane and Walnut Drive. So you can see Fern Cottage in the foreground and the tip of the gable of the Orchard Wing just in the centre there. And the bottom left, <coughs> excuse me, is taken from within the garden of Fern Cottage and shows the existing relationship with the Orchard Wing. The bottom right is taken further back along Walnut Drive, looking towards Oldfield Lane. Um, the orchard wing is just slightly discernible behind the trees there. And then finally, the portrait photo to the very right is taken from within the upper bedroom of Fern Cottage, looking into the existing site across to the properties of First Avenue. So um, for the reasons um, outlined in the officer report, these applications are recommended for permission and consent. Thank you very much, Sam. And now I'll invite the speakers um, to speak. And first of all, we have got Richard Deller um, and then Alexandra Bess, and they have six minutes to share. It's six minutes because it's two applications being taken together in case anyone queries why the figures were three read out earlier, but this is just building and full together. So first, Richard, and then Alex. Thank you. Good morning, councillors. The current application is the third made in the last six years. The previous two applications were rejected by the council on the grounds that the proposed developments represented an overdevelopment of the site with significant loss of green space and that they were out of character with the local conservation area and listed buildings. Those previous rejected applications proposed to increase the internal floor area of the care home by up to 55%. The current application to which there have been over 80 objections from local residents is almost identical in size and mass with the internal floor area increasing by some 50%. The current proposal is also termed a contemporary design comprising an office type building with inverted pitch roof and full height metal windows. This is hideously out of character with the existing listed buildings and surrounded areas. It would therefore be totally inconsistent and incompatible with the council's previous decisions if this application were to be approved. Notwithstanding and whilst acknowledging the harm to the existing local environment, the council's planning officer has recommended that the application be permitted on the basis that public benefit outweighs any such harm. The planning officer lists a number of public benefits. Principal amongst these is the suggestion that bed spaces will increase by 15. This is a totally 
misleading proposition. The design and access statements of both the previous applications and the current application confirm that there are 52 existing bed spaces. However, the planning officer now notes only 34 bed spaces. This is due to the fact that Cedar Care Home itself has reduced the number of care bed spaces by repurposing the orchard wing as staff accommodation. Therefore, the suggestion that there will now be an increase from 34 to 50 bed spaces is therefore both disingenuous and inaccurate. As the design and access statement confirms, bed spaces, whether used for care or not, will change from 52 to 50, i.e. a net reduction of two. Of course, this repurposing of the existing accommodation also suggests that the need for care bed spaces in this location is not critical. Indeed, based on pre-COVID data, the council has estimated a current surplus of 21 beds in Bath, hence the proposal is in excess of need, particularly given Bath's new 79 bed care home opening at Oddown. As to the other so-called public benefits listed by the case officer, Removal of exactly unsightly steps, this is a minor matter and could easily be done at any time without the need for redevelopment of the site. Improved design, this is entirely subjective and in fact the view of local residents is that design is infinitely worse than previous proposals. Improvement in quality, there is no reason why existing accommodation cannot be improved and updated. Creation of jobs during construction phase, this is an entirely temporary benefit. And improvement of access, this, again, this can easily be undertaken without the need for total redevelopment of the site. In summary, the objectors consider the planning officer report to be misleading and flawed in its logic and conclusions. I therefore urge the planning committee to heed the 80 plus injections, objections from all four sides of the site and be consistent with previous decisions in rejecting these what an entirely inappropriate scheme, which will bring considerable harm to the local neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, councillors. The proposed extension due to its excessive scale, bulk and massing would cause harm to the architectural significance and setting of a pair of listed buildings and would neither preserve nor enhance the character and appearance of the conservation area. While of poor design, the orchard wing retains a visual separation from the villa in wider townscape views due to the low height and scale and recessed position of the existing single storey link. The two storey link would impose on the visual prominence of the villa and would be conspicuous in mid-range public views. It would create an awkward visual challenge to the aesthetic dominance and detached standalone character of the villa with detriment to its special architectural and historic interest. It would propose the vis visual intensification of development on a site that is of a historically lower density due to the building's detached setback position within spacious gardens, typical of other examples of grade two villas along Oldfield Road. The development will propose a significant increase in width and bulk along Oldfield Lane, resulting in a more imposing dominant overlook over the narrow Oldfield Lane and the non-designated heritage asset Fern Cottage to the south. It will be highly visible within sloping mid-range views from the conservation area across King Edward Road and towards Monksdale Road and from points such as the Monksdale Road cycle path bridge due to its height, massing and incongruous roof profile. This would result in visual detriment to a well-used southwestern approach to the entrance of the conservation area. We maintain that this proposal constitutes overdevelopment of the site and would result in harm to the setting of a pair of listed buildings. The application proposes an increase of two bedrooms on the existing facilities, but a decrease in total capacity by four bed spaces. The possible retrofit of the existing buildings has not been explored within this application, as considered in the previous refused 2015 and 2017 schemes. Any public benefit is limited and does not outweigh or justify proposed harm to the listed buildings and the conservation area. This committee previously refused the 2017 scheme on the site in 2019, in which the orchard wing would be retained on grounds the proposed scale, design and location of the extension was considered to result in the overdevelopment of the site to the detriment of the setting of the listed buildings and the conservation area and created an overly dominant and unsympathetic relationship with the listed buildings. These reasons for refusal remain applicable to the application before you today. This proposal would constitute harm to the significance and setting of a pair of listed buildings and would neither preserve nor enhance the character and appearance of the conservation area and wider public views. This harm would not be outweighed by the limited public benefit. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we next have Dale Evans, the agent, and Manel Desai, the applicant, to speak. 
Uh, uh, good morning. Um, you will shortly hear uh, direct from the applicant about the scope of complex uh, nursing care provided by Cedar Care at Cedar Park. Uh, firstly, um, however, can I thank both officers and the applicant for the positive way they have worked together on the scheme since the previous refusal. We have met with officers on numerous occasions and kept local residents informed. As officers state, the scheme is indeed a significant rethink and a marked improvement over the previously refused scheme. The applicant and his architect have responded proactively to comments, suggested amendments, requests for additional details, and the requests for management documents to address some of the existing issues. As a result, the previous reasons for refusal are indeed resolved. The existing, the existing entrance and lobby is retained and the listed building better revealed. The new extension is now set away from the listed building and subsidiary to it. Its design is a positive enhancement of the area, replacing the very poor existing extensions. Appropriately sized landscape gardens are provided and the development makes a positive contribution to the wider landscape setting as demonstrated through the verified images and there are no highway, ecology, drainage or other technical concerns. While residential amenity was not a previous reason for refusal, the proposed extension improves the existing position for residents and by proposing a, by proposing a small reduction in bed spaces, we remove the existing unattractive and outdated extensions and replace them with modern extension with a better vehicle access, cycle parking, better noise insulation, better control on internal lighting, and the use managed through an agreed waste management strategy and a travel plan on all of these are positives. One significant and specific improvement was the amendment of the scheme to cut back the originally proposed western end of the southern extension and the specific removal of an existing directly overlooking window to the Fern Cottage Garden. In relation to construction, we, are, we will agree a construction management plan. The heritage impact, if there is any adverse impact at all, is described as at the very lower end of the less than substantial range. The socio-economic benefits are significant, comprising the provision of complex care, but also heritage enhancements and sustainability, ecology, servicing and general traffic and transport improvements. The scheme now proposed is a significant and proactively negotiated improvement to the previous proposals and of course the existing position. There is no adverse impact to residential amenity and no technical objections. This is a long established existing care home providing essential complex care in a highly sustainable location and we would like this to continue. The application is legally compliant, it's fully supported by existing local and national policy and is fully supported by your officers, including conservation, uh, arboriculture, ecology, and landscape. Uh, thank you. I'll now, if possible, hand over to the applicant. Thank you, yes, carry on. So I think we're looking for Minal Desai, if she's available. Good morning. When Cedar Care took over the former St. Catherine's Nursing Home in 1991, it was one of the oldest nursing homes in Bath and was operating as a nursing convalescence home by the Catholic Order Sisters of Mercy. Having successfully operated Cedar Park for the last 29 years, we worked closely with the council and responded to the evolving needs of the local elderly population. We have over, year, over the years developed the experience and stability to provide care for people with complex needs. Indeed, it's well known in Baines that unlike most residential care homes, we welcome local authority funding rates, whilst also looking after people who have enduring multiple morbidities and require very high level of nursing care interventions. Cedar Park therefore provides and has long provided an essential cost-effective service in a sustainable city location. Since its redevelopment in 1991, 
the face of nursing care has changed immensely. Whereas then we welcomed people to Cedar Park who were independent, often mobile. We now look after people who are very frail and needing support in every aspect of their life. Almost all of our residents are unable to mobilize independently and are wheelchair or bed bound and requiring an extensive use of mobility aids and hoists for transferring from bed to chair um, and wheelchairs to get around the home. The accommodation therefore needs to comply with the high standards of modern disabled access standards in order to maximize the comfort and safety of our residents. Bedrooms, corridors, bathing and toileting facilities and all amenities need to be larger and suitably arranged for the use of mobility equipment. And this can only be achieved by the proposed restructuring. However, the existing home is not fit for purpose. And, the, and 18 of the bedrooms are currently not in care use due to their outdated size and layout. It is for this reason that we sought to restructure Cedar Park. It is not to expand our current provision, but to improve accommodation so that the community can continue to benefit from our experience in an environment fit for its purpose. I would also like to add that having operated care homes in Bath since 1991, we're proud of its heritage. Can you please come to a conclusion, please? This is evident in the seven homes we have successfully driven up, driven up so far, which set well in their neighborhoods and have provided a much needed service and employment in the Bath community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, finally, Councillor Sean Stevenson McCall, the local ward member. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you very much to Councillor McKay for both of you allowing this application to be decided at committee. Um, there's been significant local interest in this and the two previous applications with media coverage of the judicial review outcome and more than triple the number of public objections against this third application on this site in recent years. These are objections include institutions such as the local St Bart's Church, the Bath Users, uh, sorry, the Bath Bus Users Group and Bath Preservation Trust. There were many serious and legitimate concerns raised by local residents and by wider groups about this application. Admittedly, this and all care home provision needs to be fit for purpose, and it is important that care home rooms and facilities are updated as soon as possible and are future proof, and I welcome the efforts of the applicant to do this. However, these buildings need to be sensitive to the local context and not to harm the residential amenity of neighbouring properties. This is a particular challenge when attempting to adapt a listed building in a moderately densely populated residential hillside conservation area. Since the last planning committee uh, on this site, um, the council has produced a character appraisal for the Bear Flat and Elfield Park uh, area of the Bath Conservation Area, which was produced in April 2020. I believe this provides a useful planning evidence base to help guide and inform the committee uh, on making its decisions today. It identifies that the large villas to, on the south side of Elfield Road contribute to the character and appearance of this part of the conservation area. It notes that the character of this part of the conservation area can be, and in some places is being, eroded by the cumulative effect of repeated changes such as oversized and unsympathetic extensions. It recommends that where such changes are deemed to be appropriate, consideration should be nevertheless given to the degree to which their scale, form and character enhance both the building and the conservation area as a whole. This includes the consideration of building materials which are appropriate and relevant to the locality. It also advises that the form and character of the rear of the building may well be of equal importance to that of its frontage. On opportunities to improve the area, it recommends to raise the standard for new developments to enhance the conservation area. 
and on what factors it sees as threats, it specifically warns against unsuitable redevelopment of existing sites, such as rear gardens or Victorian villas, which are out of scale uh, and or destructive of trees. I would be grateful if councillors on the committee would keep these area specific recommendations and opportunities and threats in mind as they consider the application. Residents of my concerns fall into a number of areas, namely the overdevelopment and overbearing of the proposed application, the inappropriate and insensitive design and materials used, the heritage harm, harms to public views, the impact on residential amenity, highway considerations, ecological landscape and climate harm, and the need assessment with regard to care home places. The viability of the orchard win, the planning process and the balance overall. I will now specifically just talk about a few of those because other people have spoken about the others. And with regard to overdevelopment, uh, my, many residents and groups have raised legitimate concerns with regard to the excessive scale and mass of this development. I believe this current application is oversized in scale, bulk and mass, and this is similar to previous applications which were unanimously, uh, which was refused unanimously by the planning committee in 2019. In terms of harm to public view, the proposal is much more extensive and visible to public views than the two previous, pre, two previous refused applications, which proposed new extensions concealed at the rear. Rather than causing less, I believe that this application will actually cause more harm to the visual uh, impact of, of, uh, on, in the area. In terms of ecology, landscape and climate harm, the development would result in an overall net, less of, net loss of biodiversity and no habitat plan has been provided. This is inconsistent with the Council's ecological emergency declaration to resist the, res the destruction of habitats through planning policy and development management. I am also concerned about the in inadequacy of measures to minimise and combat the carbon impact of the development. Given the Council's climate emergency declaration, I am disappointed that the proposals are not carbon neutral. This application would require four times the demolition area of the both previous proposals and therefore would remove the opportunity to retain embodied, embedded carbon in existing uh, materials. Refurnishment where possible is both cheaper and less damaging to the local environment than demolition and of new build. Refurnishment also avoids considerable waste and demolition in the construction of new buildings. In terms of the planning process, uh, residents have also raised concerns about errors and depre depre yeah, I can never say that, depressancies uh, and missed uh, objections from both the report and council planning portal, which I hope can be remedied. Residents are also understandably concerned that this would, could potentially risk an insufficiently well-balanced assessment for the recommendation of the planning committee. We have also, we have heard already, for example, about the differences between uh, what the case officer's description of, of uh, a 49 care home loss and the loss of three beds compared to a 48 bed care home and the loss of four beds. The figures have substantially changed in the report uh, post consultation. The report also states that the orchard wing, orchard wing with its 18 ensuite bedrooms is closed and are occupied. Uh, currently we believe this is occupied by staff uh, rather than uh, uh, residents of uh, the care home. There is a lack of consideration of the heritage harm to the adjacent listed buildings to the east and also uh, it inappropriately describes this as a block of flats. Fern Cottage also has three windows overlooking the development site, uh, whereas the, 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 the report says this is only a blank facade, so this is incorrect. Um, there is also no mention of the concerns with regard to obstruction of public transport on Oldfield Road. So in conclusion, this third proposal makes no meaningful attempt to address the reasons given for the two previous council's refusals in relation to overdevelopment, harm to listed building, harm to the conservation area and its impact and visibility from public views. The planning balance assessment does not consider 
harm to the local community, setting of the adjacent listed and heritage buildings and public views into the conservation area. Many of the proposed public benefits are marginal and not of scale or benefit to the public at large and have not been fully evidenced or could be addressed without the need for a major demolition or redevelopment. The proposal for fewer beds than existing commentation and represents only a modest contribution to care home provision in Bath. Therefore, I ask the committee to again refuse this oversized, inappropriate, contemporary style development to ensure consistency with the council's two previous refusal decisions and to avoid lasting harm to residential amenity, public views, the hillside conservation area, and a further detriment to the setting of the both the on-site and adjacent listed and heritage properties mentioned. And thank you very much for listening to mine and other residents' uh, concerns today. And uh, hopefully you will bear that in mind uh, when you uh, consider these ap two related applications. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now it's open to questions. And I have, first of all, Councillor Jackson and Councillor Rigby. And type in MIS if you wish to uh, speak. Thank you. Councillor Jackson. Um. You're on mute, Councillor Jackson. Right, is that okay? I was also cooking up a question for the... You're back on mute again, I'm afraid. Now can you hear me? Yes. There's a poltergeist in the computer, I do apologise. Um, the question is, I wondered if uh, we could have an explanation of the changes to the entrance, because I haven't quite got my mind round the spatial alterations um, with the changes that are proposed in this application, which I believe are different from the previous application, um, and how the cycle space, the cycle racks, um, and so on are going to work out, and what the highways officer thinks about the uh, whether the parking provision is sufficient or not. Yes, thank you, so. Chair. Oh, sorry, Darren, you go. Sorry, I'm in after oh, that. <laughs> thank you, Chair. Um, good, good morning, Councillors. Um, having assessed this one, I do believe that the, the parking provision is, is adequate. Um, the report does note that um, there, there's a slight improvement on what um, is seen as a, a shortfall in parking spaces at the, the existing care home. I would just point out to members that the um, car parking standards for this particular land use are a maximum. And when working out the maximum number of car parking spaces required, we do um, take into account all members of staff. Now, it's highly unlikely that all members of staff, which I believe are, are 50, will be on site at any one time because um, the, the, um, the residents of the, uh, the care facility do need 24 hour um, a day care. So it's highly likely that um, there will be shift patterns, which mean that all 50 um, care home staff won't, won't be on site at, at the same time. On, on this basis um, and looking at uh, a, a very slight improvement to what was um, already a shortfall when compared to the maximum car parking standards, we do believe that the provision or the retention of the existing 15 spaces is sufficient. Thanks. Yeah, just to um, add to, to, to that, um, uh, the changes to the entrance um, in terms of the changes to the listed building, um, the porch um, and the reception are remaining the same now, if that was what you were referring to. Um, and then in terms of the um, the wall, the, the actual sort of um, car and pedestrian access, the western access is being widened um, slightly. Um, and the cycle parking is, is located in the east um, front of the site. Thank you. Thank you. And you've got a legal question as well, Councillor Jackson? Yes. Um, Councillor Sean McGall uh, re referenced the question of back garden development. Um, which he thought shouldn't be allowed. But I was wondering if it was relevant or within the parameters of the um, legal dimensions of this case, 
um, that round the corner, I think it was in Bloomfield Avenue, we uh, refused an application for a back garden. Uh, well, it was about five beds, I think, which was going to overlook a bungalow and we lost at appeal. So I'm wondering whether that's relevant and also whether we ought to be considering the, the balance were this to go to appeal. Thank you. I guess that's Simon or Chris is going to help us out. Yeah, I think that I wonder if Chris can help on that one. I, it, it, I'm not sure. It's, it all depends whether that is a, the extent to which that is a material consideration. Um, but I don't know whether Chris might be able to have a say. Thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, um, planning applications have to be determined on their own merits. Um, having said that, Previous appeal decisions um, in the in the locality uh, are a material consideration, and it's really for committee to decide how much weight to give them. But um, all, all I would say is, obviously, we, the committee doesn't have that information before it today, so I would not advise giving too much weight to that, and and for the committee to look at what's on the table before it today, really. And we don't have a back garden development policy, do we? I mean, as has been said, everything has to be de decided on its own merits. So I'm not sure about objecting on the grounds of, of a back garden development. Sam, I think you were going to say something there. Yeah, I was just going to say um, we do have that policy consideration. Um, obviously, in, in this instance, the, the rear of the site um, is, has already been developed. So I, in my report, I've considered um, the existing situation um, and haven't... Uh, um, gave give, given you know um, the a level of weight to, to the backland development itself more just whether the the development is um, you know acceptable compared to the existing. Thank you, Councillor Rigby. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, just can I have a bit of clarification, Sam, on uh, bedroom numbers. Um, what are the bedroom numbers? now how many of those are usable and how many are not usable and what's the new proposal because I think if I get those numbers in my head I can then make sense of all the other things about incremental etc so could you just run through the numbers for me again please thank you yeah so at the moment there's 50 rooms but there's 52 bed spaces so 52 beds at present um, what is proposed is 49 bedrooms with 49 bed spaces so 52 bed spaces at the moment, um, 49 bed spaces proposed. Um, so a reduction in three bed spaces. The orchard wing um, is current, it houses uh, 18 bedrooms, 18 bed spaces. Those are currently closed to residents. So they're not being used for care residents. They are being used for, I believe, um, staff during the pandemic to reduce sort of risk um, and for storage, et cetera. Um, so at the moment, 18 bed spaces are closed. So um, 52 minus 18 is 34, I believe. So 34 bed spaces um, and uh, are operational and 49 bed spaces are proposed. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> okay. That's exactly what I was looking for. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McPhee. Uh, two, two questions. One, um, the agent said that you were cutting back on overlooking windows, but the councillor said there were actually three windows of a fern cottage bearing on the site, which would be correct there. Um, yeah, so Fern Cottage is um, the building, the dwelling in the corner, the site closest um, closest to the existing building. Um, I believe the councillor was referring to the three windows um, on the front elevation of Fern Cottage. I, um, you would have seen in the photos that the rear elevation of Fern Cottage doesn't have um, any um, windows. And I believed that to be the case with the side elevation as well. So I believe three windows that the councillor um, was referring to on the front of Fern Cottage. One of the photos I had was me standing in the window as well, looking towards the site. Mm -hmm. 
Um, the agent was referring to a window um, on the rear elevation of the southern wing, which is, um, you could have also seen in that portrait photo, that um, is currently overlooking Fern Cottage from um, the orchard wing. Um, and that is being removed um, and the windows are sort of being placed further down, further west along, along that southern elevation now. Um, so I think those are the two elements of um, windows and overlooking you, you were picking okay. up. And um, the agent also made the point that there were no technical objections and that the scheme was legally compliant. Would you agree with that? Um, yeah, I can just double check. As far as I'm aware, there were um, no objections. I'm just running back through and double checking. Um, for example, contaminated land. Yeah, no objection, no objection. Yeah, so um, from technical consultees, so we've got um, land, arboriculture, landscape, highways, flooding and drainage, ecology, contaminated land, environmental protection, building control, adult, adult social care, um, no objection. Um, and then um, conservation was a um, weighted balance against the public benefits. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hughes and then it be Councillor Craig with questions. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, actually, you've, you've answered part of my first, I've got two questions, and you've answered part of the first question to Manza. Um, but I'm just looking at, so as far as viability is concerned, as there's such a small increase in the number of beds, I guess the, fina the, the financial focus of viability is all based around the orchard wing, um, which you say is currently closed. Have, have we got any information to, to understand why the orchard wing is now no longer fit for purpose? Yeah, so it's because of the um, type of nursing care um, that, that takes place in there. Um, the um, bedrooms aren't um, of a size now um, where they're um, fit for purpose in terms of, for example, you can't get round the side of the beds, every side, you know, um, sometimes they're inaccessible from one side, um, which is difficult, um, or sometimes, you know, they, they need specialist equipment to, to help people in, in and out of bed or in the beds. Um, so, and some of them don't have um, ensuite bathrooms, for example, um, and the other sorts of facilities that would be expected. I think as well, the corridors are very narrow in terms of being able to um, turn beds and wheelchairs, um, etc. So there's a number of reasons why that orchard wing um, is, is basically not fit for the level of care which Cedar Park provides. Okay, thank you. And so uh, quick, my second question. Um, so has the applicant provided any technical reasons why the design seems to have very little connection with the main building? Um, or is it just, is it purely down to a, a cost consideration? Um, well, the design is obviously taking a, um, a contemporary approach with some of the detailing has been taken from the listed building um, and sort of derives from, from that, but it is contemporary. Um, I think they went with a um, sort of that juxtaposition rather than to, to go for sort of something pastiche um, to read as an addition. Um, but it's, um, you know, it's bath stone, it's, you know, glazed. Um, it's not uncommon from, from designs we would see across the city. Um, so the design approach is, is you know, been taken from um, a mixture of its setting um, and the, the, the function, the function and form. Okay, but there's, but there's no technical reason why it, it looks so industrial. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a design choice. It's not, there's nothing functional that has to be considered in this design. Um, well, the function obviously is the, you know, the care home and the space required um, internally and, you know, the lighting and residential amenity, but design is, yeah, it's obviously subjective. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Craig. Thank you, Chair. Okay, so some of mine have been answered. Um, so there was assertion, an assertion made by one of the um, um, people that spoke that um, the number of 
bed could be maintained by refurbishing Orchard Wing. I, I was on the physical site visit last time this came before us. Um, orchard, the Orchard Wing rooms are pretty dreadful, I have to say. Um, I wouldn't want a relative of mine in one of them. Um, but I just wanted to double check that I don't believe that the same number of rooms could be maintained in the Orchard Wing if they were refurbished to a standard, which is considered safe, i.e. access from all sides of the bed uh, and en suite um, accommodation. So that's one question. Um, a quick, most of the questions I was going to ask about Fern Cottage have been answered, but I seem to remember again from the previous site visit, there was some controversy about a retaining wall that um, came up in the objections as well, which I wonder if you could just touch on that. Um, and finally, uh, I suppose relatively small things, I, I know one of the gates, the, the lower gate on the slope is going to be widened to allow better access to the road for bigger vehicles, make it safer. That gate has got quite a uh, has got a lovely curve on it. The stonework's got a curve on the downward slope, uh, and it's not clear from the diagram whether that will be maintained when the pillar is moved out. I wonder whether you could just uh, explain what would happen there, please. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, so it's my understanding that um, uh, the orchard wing, if it was refurbished um, internally, um, would yeah, result in a reduction of bed numbers, um, similar to what's happened actually in the listed building where the plan forms have um, been changed to, to make the, the, the extra room. Um, I'm not sure what the capacity would be um, if it was just simply refurbished, but um, I can imagine it would be, would be less than, than the proposal in front of us. Um, yeah, in terms of the retaining wall and um, residents um, raised concerns about um, subsidence and, and the retaining wall. Um, I consulted with building control on the application and they considered that um, obviously with the right building control application, which would, would come after a permission um, if, we grant, if it was granted, um, that uh, suitable foundations um, and building techniques etc could be um, put in place to ensure that there wasn't any further subsistence but but also um, this this is a more of a civil matter in any case mm -hmm. um, and yeah then in terms of the gate um, yeah the pillar itself is just sorry I did have some plans with the list of building application but I didn't include it in my presentation but the pillar is just moving um, slightly um, just down um, on the western side of the western access um, to, to widen it. So it's it's really just being moved sort of as is just down. So it's sort of retaining that same um, building line of the wall. Okay, so the curve in the wall will stay there because I need, I need to take the section of wall out below the curve in order to maintain that same shape on the wall. Right, yeah, uh, um, I don't have that plan right in front of me, but I, as I understand it, that was acceptable. Right, so. thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Councillor Hodge, and then I've got people for debate after that, so if anyone else wants to ask questions, pop it in in a moment, but Councillor Hodge first. Hello, Samantha, thank you very much for the helpful presentation and lots of images, which is really good. Um, I'm, I'm still struggling with the, um, well, there's two questions for really, one quite straightforward one five trees are to be removed and I think 13 replacements but are they are they of trees of important source of mature trees and then the second thing is it's really the design the form and character of the, the buildings that are proposed so it's a bigger floor surface area and a bigger mass of buildings and I don't know whether it's possible to show a slide again I I, I find it difficult to visualize how how the new buildings will look in terms of their materials and the design how how contemporary and how potentially out of place they might look or not and and it's difficult with i know it is difficult with mocked up i mean they often are very boxy and the pictures are all the same color uh, and you've referred to it being in your report mostly ashlar and some um, aluminium frames but that's re really all we've got on materials. So we know they're flat roofs, some are going to be green. Are they green because they've got sedum on them? Are the rest of the flat roofs, what are they made of? I mean, is there any, can you, 
and there's an inverted roof, how much contrast is that? I mean, I presume you feel the contrast is okay with the um, um, the rest of the building, but is there any, could you show us a slide and uh, give any more materials information? Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. I'll just bring my um, presentation back up, just bear with me. Okay, so in terms of the trees, the, hopefully you can see this, the um, slightly lighter red line are the trees to be removed. So they're mainly over in this corner. And then the ones planted are the um, darker, bolder red rings. So they're, they're a mix, a mix of um, types are, are going in and um, the ones to be taken out are considered acceptable by the agricultural officer. Um, so if I just show you perhaps these ones um, will be the most useful. So um, yeah, it's Bathstone Ashler um, to the majority. Um, on the rear, the windows will be aluminium. There is obviously some glazing in, in the links as well, which is glass. Um, and the um, windows on the rear have these sort of um, privacy screens on them, which are a mix of um, wood and the aluminium. And then the, that rear sort of um, detailing in the middle of the orchard wing there, it is also going to be um, metal. And then the roof is a, a standing seam finish. Um, and then the flat roofs, I, um, I don't know if they're, um, I don't have, I've just got green roof here, not sedum. So I think that sedum is potentially not, um, not widely used anymore. Now it's sort of a green roof mixture, but we can add a, I've just checked, just trying to check my report and it doesn't look like I've put a condition on for the um, planting of the green roof. So if members wanted to, we could introduce one um, to, to just get more detail on, on the plants on, on the roof as well there. Um, it's obviously shown on, on the landscaping plan, but, but no, more, no more detail, just, uh, just green roof again, it's referred to, not, not sedum. So hopefully helps. Can I just ask one more question while I'm there that the orchard wing re rebuilt is is no nearer to the boundary than it was previously the amount of garden green area that was there before is exactly the same as it to the to the south. Mm, no it is me um let me show you again on the plan. Um, floor plan the site plan sorry is probably the best so you can see there yes, the, it is uh, it is new yeah. yeah yeah so it sort of steps out steps back a little bit and then steps out in the sort of western end of the garden I guess yeah so okay thank you I think that's the end of the question so then it's uh, Councillor Jackson and Councillor Hounsall and Councillor McPhee so far. So Councillor Jackson, I think you're prepared to make a proposal. Yes, and then be I debated. Am. Um, in an ideal world, we would not be allowing this because of the impact on the listed building. But there is already a substantial building there. Uh, and I think that this proposal um, that's on the table, you know, this application that's on the table now is actually a sort of tidying up. It's a considerable improvement. And the way I looked at the block form when you showed it, it seemed it was introducing a sort of symmetry between the heritage buildings at the front of the site on the road um, and the bulk and the massing was in a way balanced off and was similar, whereas the current extension uh, looks much more elongated. I was on the previous site visits and 
it is totally unfit for purpose, that um, extension. The applicant is quite right. You can't maneuver a wheelchair around the doorways very easily. Um, if you've got immobile people and there's you know, a shortage of accommodation for them, um, it's got to be updated and modernized. And frankly, I don't think that the orchard uh, extension as it currently exists is worth the repair. There are times when it's better to get something new than to build something, um, than to try and patch something up. Uh, it's been mentioned that there is a, a surplus of beds in Bath, 26 at the moment, um, but this is not taking into account the dire need for beds in North East Somerset. Uh, again, in an ideal situation, the, man the management of this well-established business would be building homes on the odd down car park, uh, which we put in the conditions for the Sainsbury's extension, or on Fosway South, where there should be a care home and there isn't, um, or the Purnell site, where again, we had uh, get consent, given consent for a new build. But um, we are where we are. We've got this application in front of us. While my residents are being sent to Oak Hill or Salisbury even, or other parts of Bath, the other side of Bath, with all the difficulties of getting over there on public transport, uh, I think we have to weigh very considerably the need for North East Somerset residents to have a good place to go to. And therefore I'm proposing um, that the need outweighs the harm to the heritage building, which actually I don't think will be as, as great as is envisaged. Um, we want this to remain a living, well-used building. We don't want it to stand empty and unloved and unused uh, if the uh, nursing home were to move. So I'm proposing we accept the officer's recommendations, but with the addition of a condition um, that um, the planting of the green roof should be uh, presented to the uh, officer's satisfaction uh, before it's implemented. Thank you. Um, before I move on, does that find a seconder? Uh, I'll second that. Thank you, Councillor Hounsell. Um, and it's actually you next to speak in the debate anyway, so if you want to carry on. You're on mute. You're on mute, Duncan. Sorry. Okay, can you hear me now? That's good, thank you. Uh, yes, I agree with uh, much, if not all, of what Councillor Jackson has just said. Um, uh, I can uh, uh, compliment the planning officer on a very well presented report, and I agree with her uh, judgment and balance uh, weighing everything up. Um, there's just two, uh, uh, rather than repeat uh, all the points that uh, have been made and could be made, I just want to pick on two. And the public benefit of improving the quality of accommodation and facilities within the care home in line with modern requirements. Uh, for me, that is an immense social benefit. Uh, and um, uh, that, that has great uh, weight in my uh, decision making. Uh, the other is the improved design of the proposed extension. I, I know design is always subjective, uh, but I, I think it's a, uh, it, it fits. Uh, it's better than what's there. Um, I, I'm perfectly content with the uh, uh, with the design. Uh, I think it's been very uh, uh, thoughtful uh, and intelligent. Uh, so for those particular reasons uh, and everything else in the officer's report, uh, I would uh, recommend uh, and happy to second a decision to permit, uh, delegate to permit. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McPhee and then Councillor Hughes. Uh, yes, uh, I also support. I, I was very um, uh, taken by the uh, applicant's point that the type of person and the needs that they have have changed so much since they first started back in the 1990s. And clearly you cannot keep the building as it currently is. And it does seem to me that they've worked hard to reduce the height of the, the new uh, building and uh, in also reduce the damage to the, the harm from, from the to the listed building. 
And so I will be supporting the motion. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Hughes. Yeah, hi. I, I mean, I, I agree with with the previous the, the previous comments, but I and I appreciate that this is a the, the existing building is is an ugly building, but I just feel that this this has such a dominant elevated position in the area in the conservation area that I think this design should reflect the heritage that it's surrounded by and attached to, and I don't believe that this design does that. I believe that that this could be achieved the number of um, the number of rooms, the, the residential requirements could all be achieved with something that was far more sympathetic to the area that it sits in. So I, st I still have serious concerns about the industrial look and the, for me, a, a disconnected look from the main building. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Craig. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I agree with what's been said so far, and I'd also like to add, um, you know, I was on the previous site visit and saw this when it came for us uh, last time, and I'm really pleased to see that the internal changes that are going to be made to the listed property itself have been removed, and I, that's made a big difference for me, and also that uh, more of the uh, reverse of the listed building is now revealed in the new design because the previous one, it, a lot of it was covered up. And I think that, that met, that's made a big difference to me and I'll, I'll be supporting this uh, motion. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think there's any other speakers, my knowledge. Quickly, uh, Councillor Hodge. I just want to say, um, I'm going to find this a very difficult decision either way to vote on. I agree with a lot of um, what Councillor Hughes says. I, I, it, there's very strong arguments either way. I, I would prefer to feel more confident about what it is, is going to look like, that extra bulk um, and the impact, um, the visual impact for people that live in that area. So, um, but it, so I'm, Yes, it's a very, very difficult decision is what I would like to say. Thank you. So I think now that's all the speakers. So we need to go to the vote. So we have a proposal to accept the recommendation as printed before us with an additional uh, condition regarding the uh, flat roof, um, which I think Sam picked up as we were speaking and suggested. Is that correct? Is that correct, Councillor Jackson and Councillor Hansel? So I'll go to the vote and as usual, we'll read it out in uh, alphabetical order. Uh, first of all, Councillor Appiard is not present for this. So Councillor Clark? Four. Councillor Craig? Four. Myself? Four. Councillor Hodge? Four. Councillor Hounsell? Four. Councillor Hughes? Four. Councillor Jackson? Four. Councillor McPhee? Four. And Councillor Rigby. Four. Therefore, that um, is uh, unanimous. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for the speakers and uh, people who've taken part. Um, sorry, Sally, I think, sorry, Chair, I think you need to take two votes for this. Oh, one. I do. I'll take, that. I'll take that was for the um, the um, full application. Sorry about that. I should have checked that and I made a note to myself before I started. I should have oh. checked. So Councillor Jackson, Councillor Hounsel, are you, are you prepared yeah. to make the same recommendation? The listed yes. building section. Yes, definitely. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. And so we'll go back through the same. I'll go up the other way this time, so you don't feel left out. Councillor Rigby, I'll go to you first this time. Four. Uh, Councillor McPhee. Four. Councillor Jackson. Four. Councillor Hughes. Four. Councillor Hounsell. Four. Councillor Hodge. Four. Myself. Four. Councillor Craig. Four. Councillor Clark. Four. And Councillor Appiard is not present for this section. Sorry about that. Um, so I see you put a two minute break, Ellen, and there's something I suspect we'll just mention the next item. I think would be a wise thing to do. Because, um, some information has come in while we've been during this meeting. So I'm just looking to see. I think it probably counts. Uh, will it be Chris? Are you going to talk about it? Thank you, Chair. Yes. Um, the next item on the agenda, which is 38. Lincoln Hill. Um, in the last 15 minutes or so, we've just received an appeal decision um, which has allowed um, a, an alternative uh, scheme. So that's obviously highly material to 
the proposal and to the case officer's recommendation. So it 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 would be advisable, strongly advisable, that this 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 item is 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 deferred so that the officer can properly consider the the appeal decision that's been received and any implications for um, her recommendation recommendation. So I, I I would suggest strongly, Chair, that the item is is deferred and not not discussed and determined at uh, this committee meeting today. Thank you. So I think what we're asking is we ask for a withdrawal, Councillor Jackson. Oh, could I ask if the appeal decision is in favour of the council or not? No, it's not in favour of the council, which is the reason for suggesting we withdraw this item. Right. Um, do I need a proposal, Councillor Rigby? I think that makes perfect sense to me. I think that's obviously a material consideration and we should both give the officer the time to uh, take into account that and also us to then be able to read it and, and discuss it. So I will formally move that we defer discussing this to our next meeting. Thank you. I've not, just realised, I don't know if we've let Councillor Appleyard back in before <laughs> I take a vote. I just have realised that. I'm just having a quick look. I don't think he's back in. So I suspect I better just wait a moment. Um, thanks, Raph. We are just come back in. Did you not see him there? Oh, there. How can I not see you right in the middle of my screen? Sorry, thanks, Raph. Um, so we just go back through that a bit. I'm sorry about that, thanks, Raph. Um, the next item we just had a ruling, um, it's been to a, the previous application on it, it's been to appeal, and that has been um, upheld. So we're suggesting that the next item we withdraw to allow the officer to reconsider. Um, the recommendation. So we're just going to take a vote on that. It has been proposed by Councillor Rigby and uh, Councillor Jackson um, that we withdraw the next item. So I just realised you weren't in joining us before I took a vote. So does that sum up fairly where we are? Yeah. Okay. Is that clear with you, Councillor Appleyard? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It means I can get me cheese sandwich earlier. Right. Thank you. So. Um, we have a proposal to withdraw this item, and I'm sorry for anyone who was um, joining us to speak, uh, but I think it's the most sensible thing that we can do um, at this stage. So, Councillor Appleyard, are you quite happy that we withdraw it? Yes. Uh, Councillor Clark? Yeah, was it seconded, but yes. Yes, it was, yeah. It was between okay. uh, Councillor Rigby and Councillor Jackson, yeah. Councillor Craig? Yeah. Four. Uh, myself, four. Councillor Hodge? Four. Councillor Hangsall? Four. Councillor Hughes? Four. Councillor Jackson? Four. Councillor McKay? McPhee, I mean, sorry. Four. And Councillor Rigby? Four. Right, so I think that means we've finished now before lunch, because the other items obviously we can't pull forward, they expect them at two. So um, we break in now until two o'clock, so can I remind you to uh, turn off your uh, videos and so on, and as Councillor Appleyard says, you'll be able to get your sandwiches quicker. Thank you very much.
very, and it's not as important to have kids for this reason. Another package.
Hello, Winston. thinking I think we're all back now I'm just having a quick check through uh, according to the chat chair Sue is here but he's waiting yeah. for the video to be restarted yeah yeah Marie do, oops, Marie, do we usually do a uh, roll call first I think we do don't we just to double check it probably safer too. Oh, yeah, yeah. Don't do, but yeah, it's probably worth it. All right. So I'll just do that first, and then I know you're going to give a reminder to the public uh, speakers about the routine for that. So uh, welcome back, everyone, to the meeting for our longer than usual lunch break today. I have to say, um, and I hope Rob enjoyed his cheese sandwich. So let's hope we're all here. So first of all, Councillor Appleyard, present. Uh, Councillor Craig, Clark. I mean, sorry. Present. Councillor Craig, present. Uh, Councillor myself here, Councillor Hodge. Present. Uh, Councillor Hounsell. Present. Councillor Hughes. Present. Uh, Councillor Jackson. Present. Councillor McPhee. Present. And Councillor Rigby. Present. And we have got Chris back with us. I saw Simon, I can see Marie's with us. And I've seen the officers clicking in as we go, including Darren and Tess. So I think we're all here. So. Reed, you just want to give a reminder um, about the public speaking procedure. Yeah. Members of the public and parish councillors have registered to speak about individual planning applications on the agenda. Ward councillors not on the committee have also indicated they wish to speak about applications. Speakers will be called to speak immediately after the case officer has made their presentation about the application. The order of speakers and time allowed for speaking will be as follows. Parish Town Council representatives will speak first and will be allowed three minutes in total. Objectors to an application will be allowed three minutes in total. Supporters of an application will be allowed three minutes in total. Ward councillors not on the committee who've indicated they wish to speak about an application may do so for a maximum of five minutes. I will time the speeches and inform the chair using the chat function when the time is up. The chair will then ask speakers to immediately conclude their remarks. After making their statement, speakers will remain in the meeting so that they can observe the debate. However, they have no further right to speak and should mute their microphone and switch off their video. They should not make any comment using the chat function. Once their item has finished, speakers will be removed from Zoom and can view the rest of the meeting on YouTube if they wish. Thank you very much, Marie. Um, so we start this afternoon with the application at 138 Wells Road, Lincoln, and Tess is going to take us through that one. Thank you, Chair. Can you see my screen? No, I'm afraid you can't at the moment, Tessa, no. no. All right, let me try again, sorry. Yeah, that's okay now. Perfect, thank you. So this uh, application is for a property at 138 Wells Road. It also relates to the adjacent building at numbers two to six Wells Way. The application seeks planning permission for the erection of several residential apartments and associated works. As a point of clarification, the committee report doesn't confirm why this application is being heard at committee. This was called to committee by the local ward councillor. Councillor McCabe considered this request and confirmed that as the previous application for purpose built student accommodation, which does not need to provide parking, was refused due to the loss of residential 
Yet this residential development is being refused due to the lack of on-site parking as per policy. It was considered by Council McKay that should be resolved at committee. So the site is edged in red. It relates to a corner building which fronts Wells Way and fronts the Wells Road in Bath. It currently has commercial use on the ground floor and where there are upper floors, these are currently in residential use. The aerial photograph shows a three-storey flat-roofed corner building and then adjoining single-storey building which fronts Wells Road. It appears in this photograph really as a gap between the two buildings. So these are the existing elevations. So the first is the east elevation, which faces Wells Way, so out onto the bare flat. And below that is the west elevation to the rear of the site. So as you can see from these elevations, this part of the building is three storeys with a flat roof, with commercial uses on the ground floor and the residential uses above. To the right of the slide is the uh, north elevation. This faces onto the Wells Road, so if you're going down the hill into Bath. This also has commercial uses on the ground floor and where there are upper stories that that's residential as well. And then to the, the bottom of that slide is the south elevation, which is the rear of the site. So as you'd be viewing it from within the bare car park. So these are the existing floor plans. The existing ground floor plan shows commercial uses on the ground floor and then the associated functions and the entrances to the upper floors. There's currently an entrance on the Wells Road and the Wells Way. But the existing first floor shows uh, three flats and then one or two bed flats. And then the existing second floor again is residential in use. So that's another three flats on that floor. And then just the roof plan, just showing the, the makeup of the roof, which is a flat roof at present. So these are the proposed elevations. So the proposed east elevation illustrates the roof extension in the mansard roof, which will contain additional residential units. The elevation below shows the elevation as you'd view as coming up the Wells Road, although in reality, you'd only really see a small part of that elevation really the bar stone element if that due to the existing buildings adjacent to the site it also shows again the mansard roof extension so these are the proposed elevations again so this is the elevation which will be visible from wales road so the north elevation again this shows the Man's had roof extension at the third floor and then the infill extension above the single storey commercial units. And below that is the rear extension. So it's the rear elevation. These are the elevation, the street steam elevation. So this elevation is showing it from the top one is from Wells Road. So as you're going up the Wells Road towards the bare flat, you can see again the, the roof extension and the infill extension. And below that is the elevation street scene from the bare flat, so from the Wells Way. Again, you can see at the corner of, of this a street, the elevation with the roof extension shown clearly. These are the proposed floor plans. So the ground floor plan shows the commercial uses retained there's an additional bike store and cycle store on the ground floor to serve the new units on the first floor the residential units will be retained but reconfigured to allow for changes to staircases etc within the extension elements there will be additional flats Again, this is the proposed second floor, which again shows the existing retention of the residential units and within the extension, the infill extension, additional residential units. And then finally, this is the third floor, which is the roof extension, which show residential units accommodated <coughs> within the mansard roof. This is the proposed roof plan, which simply just shows the inclusion of the solar panels on the roof. So this couple of photographs of the site is probably quite a familiar building to, to many of you. This is the three-storey element, which you can see. And then as you go just 
started from hitting the Wales Road, there's a single story element above the, the commercial unit, which is the hairdressers. These are some visuals of the proposed development. So you can see the mansard roof in the first photograph and then the infill extension in the second photograph. Uh, these are some photographs, it's not too clear, I'm afraid, these photographs, but these were submitted during the application process following concerns from third parties that the roof extension may block views of the hillside beyond the site. <clears throat> so these are just the before and after photographs showing that there's, there's not really a, a noticeable difference between the two when looking from, from these views further afield. As the application is being recommended for refusal due to lack of parking provision, I thought it'd be helpful just to show, <coughs> excuse me, to show the resident permit zones within the nearby area. So there's a recently implemented permit zone 18, and then there's a number of other resident permit zones nearby. The site is central within the uh, slide. So you can see the Wells Road and the Wells Way, which is the red road, and it's just as it loops round into, into a straight. So part of the site is within residence zone 18 and part of the application site is located outside of the residence permit zone. And the application is recommended for refusal as set out within the officer report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hester. And we have um, some public speakers. And first it's uh, Coral Courtesy Agent. Over to you, Coral. Can anyone, everyone hear me? Great. Yes, <laughs> cool. Okay, dear members, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. This application follows the refusal of a previous scheme for 28 student apartments, which resulted in over 50 objections from local residents and the Bear Flat Association. The applicant has listened carefully to the concerns raised about student accommodation and as such has revised the proposals to a residential scheme. As a result, there are now almost no objections to the development. The proposals are now for the provision of seven one and two bedroom flats, providing a type of accommodation which will be at the lower end of the price spectrum. This kind of housing is desperately needed in the city of Bath. The scheme will be delivered through a number of extensions to an existing building, making the most effective and efficient use of land in a highly sustainable location, which is strongly supported by the MPPF. There is only one reason for refusal for members to consider today, which relates to the lack of parking on the site and conflict with policy ST7. Since this was adopted, there's been a major shift in government policy, which strongly seeks to increase densities on existing brownfield sites, heavily promotes building upwards and encourages individuals to use more sustainable forms of transport, including walking, cycling and buses or trains. This site is very well located to achieve this. It is our view, therefore, that the policy is now outdated and does not help contribute towards meeting <coughs> climate change targets. Providing parking as part of the scheme will simply encourage individuals to have a car, just because they can. By not providing parking, this encourages residents to reframe their thinking about transport options, and we consider this positively contributes to reducing private car use and therefore carbon emissions. Furthermore, we are aware that the council is planning to review local plan policies relating to parking for this very reason, and we understand that this could involve them changing to maximum standards in locations such as this one. This would be very similar to the approach applied in Bristol City, and we consider this positively responds to the climate change emergency. We do not agree with your highway officer's assertion that the lack of parking would cause harm to highway safety. New residents would not be allowed a parking permit, and whilst it's acknowledged that it's on the edge of a residence parking zone, it wouldn't necessarily mean that residents would park in positions which would impede traffic, nor on double yellow lines. As your planning officer has noted, it is up to individuals to park legally and safely. Members have already previously overturned an officer's decision for a very similar application at Chivers House in 2018. In our view, the application before you lies in an even more sustainable location compared to that site, and it would therefore be very reasonable to apply the same approach here. It would not be unprecedented, but a positive step for the City of Bath in acknowledging the need to forego cars and focus instead on providing residents with the opportunity to walk, cycle or use public transport. We therefore respectfully request that you overturn your officer's recommendation to refuse the application and grant this very sustainable development planning permission. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we also have the ward councillor, uh, councillor Duguid. Good afternoon, fellow councillors. 
Thank you for agreeing for this application to be discussed in committee today. I and the local community really need your help in deciding the outcome. The officer has given a fair and well-balanced report in my view, which highlights the issues and concerns of the community. The only thing I'd add is that many in our community give more weight to the bigger picture, specifically the need for more affordable non-student accommodation in the city, be it rented or purchased. This proposal will be attractive to a younger demographic, a demographic that is receptive to the active travel agenda. So my concerns were fivefold. How would the no parking provision work? Well, the developer has made it very clear that residents will be made aware when buying or renting that off-street parking and on-street parking in the residential area will not be permitted. Bus stops are on the doorstep. Furthermore, I can give you local knowledge and that 100 metres from the development is a parking place designated for the local car share club. Also, with the increasing propensity of electric bikes cycling up and down Holloway and Wells Road is now more achievable. I also believe that Voy, the e-scooter company, are looking to extend their geofencing to include Bear Flat later this year. In addition, I am less concerned about visitor parking to the new development as there is available space and shared residence parking and visitor space for two or three hours within close proximity. My second concern was the abuse of yellow line parking by residents further down the road. This needs better enforcement by parking services. I have requested more frequent patrols across Bear Flat and I have been led to believe that this will happen when parking services have a full establishment of staff post COVID. So my concerns about parking and highway matters have been somewhat addressed. So is my third concern about visual impact. Some residents will always object to this change, but I listen to the Bath Preservation Trust, who like the Bear Flat Association, are supportive of the retained three, C3 function for both the retained and new apartments to meet housing demand in the city. My fourth concern and where I still have concerns is the Preservation Trust's comments that the two bed apartments on the second floor do not meet described space standards. Couple this with the lack of external spaces and it looks like we've learned nothing from COVID, nor indeed the threat of future pandemics. Committee, can you influence this today? My fifth, and where I also would like more uh, comfort, is waste. The reality is, as one objector pointed out, that refuse for the existing flats is at the top of the first flight of stairs from Wells Road. The refuse is often badly packed and falls or blows into the road below. Proper consideration should be given to the design of the refuse boxes to overcome the current situation. Perhaps committee, a planning condition could, could help this situation. So from a positive perspective, I could see my way to supporting the proposal with some more provisions. But finally committee, in the real world, I am aware of the law of unintended consequences. If you refuse this application today, the applicant's agent has made it very clear to me that the applicant will put forward a further proposal to build student accommodation above the current residential flats. It will not be the same number as before, 28, but it will be a material number. I don't see how you or the planning officer will be able to refuse such an application as the previous application of PBSA was turned down solely because it meant the demolition of existing residential accommodation. Residents are not anti-student, but they are anti-more student accommodation off campus. Traders want longer term residents who are here 52 weeks of the year, not 36, and are more permanent members of our community. And so do the residents. I urge you to amend the application where appropriate and let it through. In the broader interests of more affordable non-student accommodation in Bath, and specifically for those who want to be part of the active travel agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then it's open first of all for questions. The officer and councillor Rigby, you're first. Thank you, Chair. Um, hi, Tessa. My question yeah. is yeah. around. Um, it is around the parking, and it's not about the parking necessarily for the residents, but. Um, and I'm sure that the, the flats are going to be built to a lovely standard, but at some stage, people need plumbers, electricians, um, that kind of you know service to come. 
where is the closest place that anyone um, doing services to that to the flats could actually park? So even if the residents themselves don't have a car, there may be a need for some local parking. Where, where is that? There are some spaces just further down the Wells Way before you turn into kind of Oldfield Road. And then there's obviously spaces on the Bear Flat as well, which are either outside of the permit zone, further down the Wells Way or on the Bear Flat. But obviously that is on the basis of that, them being free. They're, they're only limited spaces. So it's whether they're free when they service, et cetera, visit the properties. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jackson. Yes, I was wondering if the officer was aware, um, or even the, uh, can't of course ask the councillor a uh, question, but I wonder if you're aware that this area is used as a sort of park and ride stop for people working in Bath who live in Redstock and Westfield. I know quite a few people and they might very well be the people who park on the lines. So it's not all local residents parking, I don't think. But I'd be interested to know if any work have been done to establish who exactly is parking around in Bear Flats and Bloom, Bloomfield uh, Road and so on. I think um, that's been a historic difficulty for Bear Flat, but I think since the implementation of Residence Permit Zone 18, that problem has lessened. I think there may be some spaces, but I think the majority of, of the problem has now gone away. And I think the Bear Flat Association did reference that in their comments to, on this application. Thank you. That, okay, Councillor Jackson. Oh, uh, yes, yes. And I, I mean, the other point to make is we didn't, we didn't get an overall picture, did we, of the location? Um, that would indicate that this is very close to, uh, is, what's the name of the park at the top of the road by the Methodist Church? The um, Alexandra Park? Yes, that's the one I'm thinking of. It's, you know, there, there are green spaces not very far away. Uh, it's what I'm, is the point I'm trying to make for these flats. Although it is a pity they haven't got balconies, but then they might look a bit strange in the location with balconies. Thank you, Councillor Hughes. Thank you. I, I, so I, I, just a quick question. I noticed in the report there's a suggestion of um, a proposed no parking um, restriction. Ideal, it says ideally would be backed up by a legal agreement with residents not to have a private car in the vicinity. So I'm just trying to understand, is that actually possible? Is it enforceable? And what sort of penalties would be, um, would be in place for that? Yeah, I think that's been referenced by a third party rather than myself. My view is that it wouldn't be enforceable and wouldn't be reasonable to have that restriction on a resident of the property. For example, their circumstances may change in the future. If we said they couldn't have a car then their circumstances change, you know, they, they got a new partner or they, they got a new job, then obviously they, they may need a car. So that, that's why you couldn't say, you know, they would never have a car. I also don't think it would meet the tests if we, it definitely wouldn't meet the test to say they couldn't have a car, to say, say that they could sign a lease would meet the test, but I don't think it'd be enforceable because there wouldn't really be anyone to enforce it. I think it's slightly different with the student accommodation where you have a management company or in charge of, of that block of flats or block of purpose-built student accommodation that would enforce it. But in this case, there wouldn't be anyone to enforce it. So I would say, no, there shouldn't be a legal agreement if you were minded to approve it. Okay, and and just secondly, are the are the existing apartments currently inhabited, or is that is it vacant? And if so, how many residents, and do we know how many cars there currently are on the site? I don't know. They are current flats and currently um, got residents in them, but I don't know how many cars they have, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Craig. Thank you, Chair. Mind about parking as well. Um, just following on from. Um, Councillor Rigby's question, the spaces nearby, thinking about plumbers and electricians, et cetera, that um, are not parking, residents parking, how long are they for? If it's only three hours, then that may possibly not work because it might take longer than that to do whatever the tradesman needs to do. And then following on from that, it seems, is there any precedent, and maybe this one for Darren, um, 
with extending an RPZ boundary when it's a bit of a perverse situation where property has been extended and the boundary now goes through the middle of the property. Is there, is there any precedent for extending the RPZ boundary so that it includes the whole of the property, which is uh, seems a bit more sensible? I know it means that they might not necessarily get a permit, but you know, at least they could possibly get visitors permits for electricians and plumbers and people. OK. Yeah, I may leave those questions to Darren. And all I would say with the difficulties with plumbers, etc., parking and resident permit zone is, is obviously a problem that or that is all around the city and every single resident permit zone. So it's not necessarily exclusive to this ish, this site. I believe they do have permits that they can use for day to day basis. But I'm not sure if Darren, you have any more information on that or any more knowledge on it. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, just just to um, come back on the first point that Councillor Craig makes. There are um, limited waiting bays and shared um, bays between residents and, and limited waiting on a number of streets um, close to the site. Some are limited to one hour waiting, no return within two hours. Some are two hours waiting, no, no return within one hour. Some are three hours waiting, no return within, within one hour. But as Tess has already said, um, Availability of those spaces really does depend on the, the number of people who want to use them. I know um, these these sort of time limited bays are um, you know, for visitors to um, existing residents in the area, and also to a number of the businesses in the area. You've got uh, that there's um, a solicitors locally. There's a, a, a fish and chip shop. There's I think two estate agents, a, a solicitor, the Good Bear Cafe. Um, also the um, the co-op food stores, so they are um, they, they are well used by visitors to the area. Um, in terms of extending the residence parking zone, I don't know of any precedents at the moment other than extensions to existing residence parking zones in sort of the centre of Bath, where um, adjacent areas are, are suffering parking stress, and the intro intro introduction of new ones. So I don't know of any. Um, Residents that have been set, but that's sort of certainly something we can ask of parking services if, if you were minded to um, approve this one. Okay, thank you. I think it's also important to note that the residents wouldn't be entitled to a residence permit zone anyway. So whether they were inside or outside or, or moved in for residence permit zone, with new developments, they're not entitled to the, the residence permit parking um, permits anyway. So it may not be a significant issue. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McPhee. Yes, uh, um, I wanted to pick up the point the agent made about the uh, change in government policy. I was very struck driving through Bristol today at Totterdown Bridge. They have a site there where they're proudly going to say they can have 160 flats and they've got the river on one side and the A4 on the other, and there is certainly no room to put uh, cars there. So I wanted to ask the officer uh, how much weight we should put towards this likelihood of, uh, well, first of all, the policy, and also the likelihood that this will be passed by Bath in due course. Given the stage of our emerging local plan, I would suggest that you give it very limited, if no weight at the moment. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't think there are any other questions unless anyone's going to type in quickly a question. If not, we'll move to uh, debate and I've got Councillor Jackson who's prepared to make a proposal. Uh, yes, thank you very much, to. Chair. I would like to propose that we accept this application um, because it seems to me that the officer's main objection is that there will be no car parking places allocated to these dwellings. And um, that given the whole climate emergency, uh, the green policies, the need to uh, reduce the air pollution in the middle of Bath um, and the highly sustainable uh, nature of this site. I mean, it's not just on top of a bus stop, but there are a considerable number of different um, bus lines that come through 
this area and you can change onto a number four and go up to the hospital and so on. Um, so it could hardly be more sustainable. Um, it's not difficult to walk down to the railway station. There is absolutely no need to have a car in this location, um, especially given the fact that some of the people who may uh, rent or buy these properties will be working from home under the new dispensation. I, I have to say, with respect to the Bath Forum and all the rest of them, um, I think our parking standards for Bath are out of date. Um, and I say that as somebody who has never possessed a car and can't drive. Uh, what we do know, though, looking around um, doing our electioneering, is the number of residences where there are four adults because the children cannot find anywhere they can afford to move to. And this is going to be much needed affordable property. Um, I'm just trying to think of planning reasons why we can um, uh, uh, um, accept it. But I mean, we do have a, uh, a presumption in favour of development in the NPPF. And I don't think that the objection on the grounds of the lack of parking, which we've explored pretty fully in this debate, is um, an appropriate objection to make at this stage in the planning policy development framework that we have. Thank you. I can see Councillor Hodge, who is due to speak next, is happy to second. And then I think uh, Chris Gorm wants to say something. So just confirm, Councillor Hodge, that you're happy to second the proposal. Yes, I am happy to second. Um, Chris, did you want to say something before we move further on? Uh, to, I expect it's to do with reasons. Thank you, Chair. I mean, obviously, it's, it's the role of the committee to apply the development plan, which includes its parking standards, um, unless there are material considerations that indicate otherwise. Um, obviously, as officers, we don't consider that there are any material considerations that it indicate otherwise. But it is, it is obviously, um, the committee is entitled to, to, to come to a different view on that matter. Um, so really, the committee needs to focus on what those material considerations are that indicate otherwise. Because if, if, if the committee um, grants permission for this scheme, that, that, that will undeniably be a departure from the development plan because the, the parking standards are, are very clear. So it, we just, the committee just needs to focus on what those reasons are for, for departing from, the, from those parking standards. And those would form uh, the reasons for granting if, if that's the way the committee is going. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, I'll go back to Councillor Jackson. I've got then Councillor Hodge give her a fair chance to speak. Then Councillor Rigby, Appleyard, Hughes and McPhee. So I haven't forgotten those of you who've dropped in. Well, so. in, in my enthusiasm for recycling, I have uh, gone and recycled the previous committee's papers. And I don't have a gadget to look up, but I know that uh, we have very recently given permission for a development. I think it was on Whitcomb Hill. It was very close to here. Um, I can see the site so clearly in my mind, and I know it's only about two streets further along from here, uh, where we permitted um, two masonettes and there was no car parking. There were other issues there about the patio stretching out and possible overlooking and, and so on and so forth. But we allowed a, uh, an application through that would provide two modestly priced dwellings uh, without any car parking. So um, it's really just a question of plagiarising the reasons we gave for that previous application. But maybe we should put delegate to permit um, to dig out the appropriate reasons for permitting. Except, of course, as I said, there is this uh, presumption in favour of development in the NPPF, as far as I'm aware. Thank you. Councillor Hodge, I'll give you a fair chance to speak now, because just now I just was clarifying that you would second it. Yes, um, I just wanted to say, I mean, I, again, I, I wish I, I, I can't think of the extra reason, actually, that we need, apart from that there's exceptional circumstances and, and the sustainability of the location. Um, but I, I would just like to say from my own personal experience, I worked for many years in London in, and I lived in accommodation that never had any parking for possibly 10 years. And I think it seems a great shame to not allow this development, which um, would have pro provide affordable accommodation for those for those reasons. I think there there will be a demand for it, and it will enhance that area. Um, 
and I will keep thinking on the, the planning reason as the discussion goes on. Thank you, Councillor Rigby. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'll be supporting the motion um, as is currently in front of us. Uh, uh, and again, struggling for the precise reason. I mean, uh, Tessa's obviously uh, totally correct that um, this does go against our, our current parking policy and our local plan isn't sufficiently um, advanced for us to be able to give material weight to that. So um, my, my argument in my head, though how we express it in planning terms, is that um, we have a lack of affordable housing uh, within Bath. We, um, and we certainly don't want to see uh, properties uh, fall into, into disrepair, though um, it, it, it seems fairly likely that this would be, this will either be student accommodation or affordable accommodation. It, it feels slightly perverse to me that we would turn down student accommodation um, previously, which didn't need parking um, permission. And now the applicant has listened to us and come back with, with affordable housing, which is something we want. And we're considering turning it down because of a policy around parking provision. It, it, it feels perverse. Um, so I, I will be supporting the motion because I want to see more affordable housing. I think it is in one of the most sustainable locations. And that to me on balance overweighs the fact that it is obviously breaking our current, our current policy. Thank you, Councillor uh, Appleyard. Yeah, I mean, I, I too would uh, support the uh, the recommendation to um, go against the officer's uh, um, recommendation there because, uh, I mean, it's made for the right reasons because uh, there is a policy in place, but I think we have to be uh, realistic and pragmatic about this. We actually want people to uh, look at the other forms of uh, movement, i.e. Uh, walking and cycling. Um, and we're trying to get away from having the car as the beginning of every conversation. And it, and it just does, does seem that uh, this is uh, so sustainable, this, this location, for so, so many reasons. It will appeal to people, but the market will sort that out because people will... Um, uh, you know, go into these properties uh, knowing what the conditions are. Uh, but what I really want to pick up on, besides obviously I'm going to support the, the recommendation, is picking up on the war councillor in terms of the refuge and the, the waste uh, regime to ensure that that is as good as it can be. And I don't know what the conditions are we can put in its place for that. But our second biggest challenge with any um, uh, uh, multiple uh, unity sites is the, 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 the way they sort of manage their waste and everything like that. And what we don't want to do is actually create something which is an eyesore. We don't want waste to be littered around the, uh, the, 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 the pavements uh, for five or six days of the week all the time. So uh, if there is something we can do to uh, ensure that's as best as it can be, as a condition, and I don't know what that would be. Um, uh, that's what I will support. Thank you, Councillor Hughes. Thank you. I, 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 I still have some serious concerns about this. Um, I personally, I don't think it's realistic to assume that nobody will have a car. I think that um, over the in years to come, we will see a transition from people moving from from petrol or diesel vehicles to electric cars, but whether we're, I don't believe we're going to see a move to no, no cars or, at all. And in an area, a congested area like this, um, where people won't be able to, 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 to move to electric vehicles because there won't be any electric vehicle charging points, um, I think we could be creating a, a problem. Um, I think the area has adapted to the existing number of residents, but I think increasing those that number of residents without looking at these parking issues may be a bit of a mistake. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McPhee. Um, I was going to speak uh, for the officer um, because she was very clear that I shouldn't give any weighting but I find myself being persuaded by the people as they've spoken. So I've switched and will support the motion. Thank you, Councillor Hounsall. 
Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm put in mind of, uh, of my, my daughter who ha whose uh, first uh, flat in London was uh, exactly this sort of accommodation and uh, certainly she um, had no opportunity to, to, to have a car. There's a whole generation of, of people that um, live without motor cars in big cities now. Um, there is a need for the affordable accommodation. We, we've been asked for planning reasons um, to um, give permission. But in fact, the officer's report gives virtually everything because it's only on parking that um, there's a concern. Uh, there's a shortfall of three to five spaces. That's the summary. And there are unique circumstances here because it's such a sustainable location close to uh, and giving access to a, a multitude of public bus services. So that's the reason why we are not using the fact that there's a shortfall of three to five spaces to uh, reject this. So I should be voting in, in support of uh, approval. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Jackson, you are next. Um, so that might well yeah, I just, I've what just you been um, looking at the previous application, the one that was withdrawn, uh, and the reasons for refusing the application on um, Lincoln Hill doesn't include the question of parking. And yet we know from the briefings we had on that one that there is no park or there would be no parking attached to 30A uh, Lincoln Hill. So I don't quite understand why lack of parking in one application is considered a reason for a refusal. Um, but another one, again, not very far away, it's apparently not a problem. And I think we should have a bit of consistency, if I might say so, with a great deal of respect, because I know the officers work very hard on these reports. So um, I would still advocate that you all support the motion I put on the table, delegate to permit, because Councillor Appleyard is quite right. The, the question of the rubbish and recycling collection arrangements does sound as though it needs improving. It's actually Chris next who come, wanted to speak anyway, so maybe I had to clarify the issue between the two no parking um, bits. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chair. I think the, as I understand it, the previous item on the agenda, which was obviously withdrawn, um, didn't involve the creation of a new dwelling, so that there wouldn't have been a, a parking or a need for additional car parking uh, with that application. So that that's why that wouldn't have, have there wouldn't have been any reasons for refusal relating. Uh, to, to parking on that particular application. Um, all I wanted to say really, Chair, was that um, just to make the point, I think I think committee needs to be careful relying on a theoretical student accommodation fallback position, because of course, there is no planning permission in place for student accommodation on this site. The previous application was refused. Um, there, there's no permissions in place. So that, that's purely hypothetical. So, so the committee really can't really give any weight to, to that position in my view. Um, I think um, as, as stated by Councillor Appleyard and Councillor Rigby and Councillor Hounsell, I think if committee are, are, are minded to, to grant permission, I, I think the reason from listening to the debate is, is, is really the, the, the high sustainability of the location and, 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 the, and the, that outweighs um, the, the council's parking standards. So, and, and, I, and I would um, sort of reiterate um, Councillor Jackson's uh, proposition that the members, that the committee um, resolve to delegate to permit, because if, 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 if committee are granting permission, we, we will need to um, draft some, some conditions. Uh, the case officer will need to draft some conditions to, to deal with all the uh, eventualities and so on. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. That's uh, Councillor Clark and then Councillor Hodge. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I, I can't support this uh, motion. I'm taken with a lot of the comments that Councillor Sean Hughes made, which uh, were almost verbatim the type of thing that uh, I might have said. So I, I very much uh, support what he said. I do support uh, the uh, officer in her recommendations and in the way that she's gone about uh, presenting uh, it in an excellent manner. And I know uh, the, my colleagues who are in favour of the motion are well, in, uh, well intended. Uh, I, I, I fully support the idea of having more affordable homes within Bath who, who could object to that. But I actually think this is, they're being a little bit naive, frankly, a little bit hopeful. Um, I think there's gonna be problems there um, if this do, it does grant, be granted, because I think it's naive to assume 
that the people that move into this area, whether we like it or not, are not going to have cars. And in addition to that, um, they will have cars despite who's, whose daughter lived in London and didn't need a car. I mean, this is not London, this is Bath, this is now. Um, and so I think the people moving in there, there will be at least some of them who do use cars, will have visitors and will have repairmen and plumbers and so on visiting them on a regular basis. So I think uh, if this does go through this motion, then I think there's a nice traffic problem with lots of disputes uh, coming, that, coming the way of this road in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hodge. As I say, I, I do disagree with a number of those comments, but the point I was making, uh, I wanted to make was, it's a minor one, but about the restrictive waiting areas. I don't really, I'm setting the local councillors more work to do, but um, I found particularly in Lansdowne, it is quite easy through the TRO process to tweak the um, restrictive waiting areas. I mean, I've done that with a couple of areas where we've got no parking and blocks of flats that have wanted um, a little bit more access for trades. And in some areas we've added, waited a year, but we've added an hour or taken away an hour to um, help people have trades come to visit, but to stop commuter parking. So there is quite a lot the local councillor can do to, to alleviate that situation. Um, so I just wanted to make that point. Um, and I do think there are a lot of young people that manage without cars and will do in the future. Thank you. I think that's the end of all the speakers. So we have a proposition in front of us to overturn the officer's recommendation and delegate to permit um, the reasons being primarily the um, sustainability um, is really good there with the buses and so on. I think it's uh, the main reason that they want to put in, plus the conditions to do with the uh, refuge and things like that. Which is, so it's delegate to permit, as I understand. Um, so it's to overturn the officer's recommendation um, and therefore to permit this uh, proposal in front of us. Um, with the reasons that we've um, outlined. Is that sufficient, Chris? Have we got uh, sufficient there? Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Right, so I will go through the uh, list and see if, how choosing to vote. So this is to, this is to delegate to permit this application. So, Councillor Appleyard? Or. Oh. Councillor Clark? Against. Councillor Craig? For. Oh. Myself against. Councillor Hodge? Or. Oh. Councillor Hounsell? For. Councillor Hughes? Against. Councillor Jackson? For. Councillor McPhee? For. And Councillor Rigby? For. So that is carried. Marie will give us the exact figures. Like Matt, I didn't bother to count them as we were going through. Yep, that's seven in favour, Chair, and three against. Okay, so that application is completed and that application is permitted. Uh, delegate to permit. Thank you very much. And thank you to the... Uh, uh, speakers who came in there. And that takes us to the last one on the agenda today. It takes us out to Hinton Charter House. I think we've got the right people in. And we're just leaving. Um, and it's over to Tess again. So, Tess, if you lead us through this one, please. Thank you. Can you see the screen okay? Yes, we can, yeah. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, this application relates to Crewcroft Barn, Hinton Hill and Hinton Charter House on the edge of Bath. It uh, seeks planning permission for the conversion of a stone barn and replacement of the existing timber clad extension to provide for a straw bale passive house standard dwelling. So the site is edged here in red. The subject barn is located off the track accessed off Hantone Hill. The arrow photograph illustrates the site um, and this is set between, you can just see with the, the black outlines, the, the boundaries of Wellow and Hinton Charter House. So these are the existing elevations. There's the main stone barn, you can see that on the first plan, the existing gable end of the stone barn. And then there's currently a timber clad extension which is partly 
underground or, or behind a bank, which you can see illustrated on the plans as well. So these are the existing floor plans. So there's existing ground floor plan, which has the existing stone barn, the original stone barn and uh, the ground floor of the stone barn. That's just one part of the building that there's not separated to two floors. And then there's the existing extension or the existing tin cloud extension, which you can see in the photograph to the right. So these are the proposed elevations. This shows the existing gable end of the stone barn retained, that part of the building retained, and the existing timber clad extension removed and replaced with a larger extension to facilitate the conversion to a four bed house. These are the proposed floor plans, which again show the existing original stone barn being retained with the larger extension replacing the timber clad current extension. These are some aerial photographs of the site. The, I think there's been some questions in the application process of, of what's original and what's been an, an extension. So the 2017 and 2014 aerial photographs show the building as is now, so with the stone barn and then the timber clad extension. 2013 and 2009 show that this isn't in existence. And then if you go back towards 2006, 2005, and 2000, sorry, 1999, this again shows just the stone barn without any other structure there. The applicant wanted to show this plan, I think it's been sent to you separately, which shows a existing barn or a, a barn that was once in, in situ. I mean, the council have looked into this and can't see any record of this. I think this is a very historic OS map. So they've given it, um, officers have given it limited weight. Um, sorry, there seems to be a couple of photographs missing from there, but I think this should hopefully give you everything you need to conclude your, to start your um, debate. Thank you. Thank you, Tessa. And so then we uh, move on to speakers. And we've got three speakers. First of all, there's Councillor Pat Cordell from well Wellow Parish Council. Over to you, Pat, when you're ready. Good afternoon, everybody, um, Chairman and Councillors. Um, although actually this barn is in Hinton Charterhouse, I'm speaking on behalf of Wellow Parish Council. Uh, Hinton Charterhouse do support the application, uh, but it, the barn is visible from Wellow rather than Hinton, so it seems to it's come into our lap. Um, our parish council would very much like to see this old stone barn brought back into use. Uh, we believe that if it wasn't in the AONB, then it would fulfil the requirements for consent under Class Q planning rules, uh, more so than for a lot of the modern barns in the area which have already had consent for change of use under this rule. Indeed, as a stone barn, it appears to be more in the spirit of the change of this planning law. Um, you'll know the applicant already owns the land which is farmed by him and his family, so this is not a speculative development by a profit-seeking developer, and it would be nice to have a local person back living and farming the land. We appreciate Highway's concerns about the need to use a car, but everyone living in Wellow and surrounding hamlets needs a car as there's no public transport. We do have a, um, a community bus which is essentially one for school use. Um, the lack of public transport hasn't been a reason in the past for refusing an application to build a couple of new properties in the village, and we see no reason why it should be in this case. Um, we feel we should all encourage buildings that embrace a high reduction in the carbon footprint, and this reuse of an historical barn 
embracing passive house principles addresses this in a way not seen in large scale developments, despite the policies for more energy efficient housing. Uh, we note the increase in size was causing concern, but this has now been scaled back and we believe now falls into the acceptable increase in, in limit. And we therefore urge the committee please to grant consent for this application. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, we'll draw the applicant. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm Will, and this is my, my partner, Zella. Um, we are the applicants. Zella and I are seeking to repurpose the building to safeguard this non designated heritage asset to become our family home as we are local people living and working in the area and expecting our first child. For generations, my family have repaired the barn, but now for no real purpose, as it is not suitable for our modern agricultural needs. If nothing is done, then the, in time the building will be lost. The National Planning Policy Framework clearly states that homes in the countryside are supported if the development would represent the optimal viable use of a heritage asset. It is this that we are proposing. The National Planning Policy Framework also supports sustainable and innovative construction. Our proposal is of straw bale and passive house, which was missed on the, on the officer's report, which is considered highly innovative and a construction method we believe should be encouraged. There are no other examples of this in the area. Regarding the increase in volume, historically the site did consist of a large stone barn in the position of the existing timber clad building. The timber clad element is of solid masonry construction with timber cladding applied to the first floor to weather the walls. We commissioned a building survey on the barn and the report concludes that all parts of the building are substantial and solid, not lightweight and therefore suitable for conversion. The building surveyor's report um, forms part of the submission documents. The proposal represents an increase in volume by 28% from what is a lawful and legitimate volume that's there today. The case officer's report from the previous application agreed with the existing volume calculation to include the timber clad element. Hence why the redesign for this current application is within the recommended limits of extensions in a green belt. With regard to design, early last year we submitted an application to reinstate the large pitch roof barn that you could see on that earlier drawing. However, the council's consultees were not supportive and recommended we redesigned with a mono pitch roof subservient to the existing stone barn and to be timber clad, similar to what is there today. We have done exactly that and the officer's report confirms this by stating the design of the extension has been amended and is now of similar scale to the existing modern barn. I note that no one has ever complained about the existing barn that's there. The current design has derived from consultations with numerous professionals including Ian Lund, our heritage consultant, who has helped lead the design. Whilst we could convert the timber clad building, we are seeking to rebuild it to achieve our sustainable goals of straw and passive house. The proposal will look very similar to what is there today, with the stone gable remaining the dominant feature of that valley. To conclude, we are putting forward a solution to safeguard the future of this non-designated heritage asset, whilst providing a self-build, sustainable and innovative home for working members of the rural community, supported by both of our parishes, all adjoining neighbours and the local ward members. We please hope that you can support us as well. Thank you. Thank you, and that leads us on to uh, one of the local councillors, Councillor Butchers. Hello. Thank you. You can see me now, okay, no doubt. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to be absolutely clear, I am indeed speaking in my capacity as a ward councillor and not as a member of the cabinet. Having spoken to the applicant and the two parish councils involved, Hinton Charter House and Wellow, as the site is right by the border, I would like to make comments under three heads, plus a summary. First, design and volume. The timber clad element is designed to be subservient to the stone barn with simple agricultural style elevation, mono pitched roof as the existing timber clad part, timber cladding and with similar eaves, heights and plan size. The ground floor design would be built into the hillside, further emphasising the subservient nature of the stone barn that would not be visible from the public viewpoints. 
The timber clad part is in the position of the original bank barn and the proposal is within one third of what is on the site today. As you have heard, the applicants have taken on board the case officer's feedback from the previous refused application and the redesign matches what was recommended. The choice of materials and fenestration in this application is supported by the conservation officer. People viewing from public rights of way, e.g. two tunnels route and Ford Road, would not see the timber clad element due to its subservient nature on the site, therefore ensuring the prominent stone gable will remain the dominant feature of the valley, much as it stands today. This is confirmed by the case officer's report stating the design has been amended and is now of a similar scale to the existing modern barn. The proposal is low carbon and with a highly sustainable construction method that we should support in our locality. Straw bale and passive house is considered an innovative construction method. The applicant appreciates, by the way, solely straw bale is not innovative, but it is the combination which makes it so. Okay, secondly, local impact. Wellow and Hinton Charter House Parish Councils, as you have heard, and all immediate neighbours are all in support to safeguard the future of the barn and complement the design proposal. With regard to the location, pretty much all parishioners have a need to drive, and this is part of rural living. Hopefully there may be some uh, local hub for walkers and uh, cyclists in future in either Wellow or Hinton, by the way. With the applicants living on site, will benefit the farm business, particularly during certain times of the year when animals are breeding, reducing travel from the main farm and improving husbandry and welfare. Car parking would be screened. If an alternative use other than residential was proposed, it is considered vehicle movements would be greater than a single family residential use. The domestic demise is within an existing wooded area, which would be further improved upon by the proposed planting scheme. Third, council consultee remarks, the tree officer from the council refers to the proposal as offering an arboricultural enhancement to the site. The council's ecologist has made reference in the past to there being a biodiversity net gain to the proposal and is, con and its, and is content. Highways are also content with the proposal and the improved access onto Hinton Hill. And the summary, a brief summary. The applicant's family have been custodians of the barn since the Second World War, spending time and money repairing it. And unless an alternative use can be agreed, the long-term use and maintenance of the building is at risk. The case officer describes that the barn adds greatly to the visual amenities of Greenbelt and it is a locally distinctive historic feature. We all agree to this, and I believe the applicant has put forward a solution that has been positively amended following the council's feedback with both parishes and all neighbours in support, and therefore it seems reasonable to support the proposal. So Councillor Matt McCabe and I would like to indicate our uh, support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Butters, and then it's open to questions. The officer in first thoughts, Councillor Craig. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I have a couple of questions. The first one's about the footprint, if Tessa could just clarify that. So, uh, have I understood correctly that there was originally a larger building where the lean-to, the more modern one, is now, and it was bigger than the modern one that's there now, but there's just no historic trace of it, there's no record of it, there's no, there's no sort of foundations visible or anything like that. Um, my second question was just about the views. I'm looking, I'm Googling it and just looking at the area. Am I right in thinking that the only really prominently visible part of the current building and what will be the new proposed building is the end, gable end of the barn? Um, the rest of it is, is, you know, not really so visible from anywhere. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, the original building has been determined to be the, the main gable end stone barn. Whilst in a presentation you were showing the OS map of a building that may have been there once, that the council haven't got any evidence of that. And even if it has, it, you know, it, it's long gone really. So we have to consider the original without that element. I don't think there's any remnants on the site. I wasn't the case officer, so I, I've not been to site, so I can't guarantee that I'm afraid. Um, in terms of the views as well, I, I haven't been to site because I'm not the case officer, 
but I think you're correct from the reading of the report and the, the from what I've how I've looked into it that the gable end is the prominent feature in local views and I think Councillor Butters with his local knowledge has obviously confirmed that as well but I think the, the case officer was concerned that the timber element would still be prominent from immediate views within the site. Okay, so can I just follow that up, please, Chair? So um, with a loca rural location like this, with a, what is quite an old building, I, I actually think it's quite important whether there's any evidence of the foundation or anything of the original building. And what what is the time frame for it not mattering anymore? I'm just interested where it's, you know, obviously a very old building. In, is your question in relation to Greenbelt or in relation to other matters? Is uh, in relation well, to any, any matters? Yeah, I think in, in relation to the Greenbelt test, we would say, you know, if it's been gone, if it's not there now, it's not existing. So if it's been removed three, six months ago or, or 30 years ago, it would really be the same okay. conclusion. I mean, in terms of the, the impact on um, heritage and understanding the, the heritage of the building, then obviously, yeah, it is important to understand those remains and how the building has evolved during during its time. Okay, and we we definitely we, we don't know whether there's any trace of the original building there at all. I don't know. I'm afraid. I think the extension that's currently there may have been built over if there were any remains. But apologies, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if Chris knows any more than I know on that, but I don't have any details, I'm afraid. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, looks like Chris hasn't really come back if he has. Uh, Councillor Harrington. Uh, thank you, Chair. Right, I'm, I'm trying to um, understand um, exactly what the nature of this application is because um, uh, development in Greenbelt is by definition harmful and there has to be exceptional circumstances uh, to allow it. Um, so is this, is this a development or is this being argued as a conversion of an existing farm building? Because the existing uh, timber clad extension is, is a, a, a temporary, um, you know, non-permanent um, uh, edifice. Um, is, is that a, is that accepted as a um, as a farm building? So what are we what are we dealing with here? Is it um, a development? Um, and the presumption is against that unless there are exceptional circumstances. Or is this um, about converting a existing farm building? So uh, which is it? Thank the you. policy RE six does allow for conversions of buildings. In, in the, the rural, rural buildings, but one of the criteria is that there shouldn't be any substantial alterations or reconstruction. And the officers concluded that the replacement of the timber extension would constitute a substantial alteration to facilitate the change of use. So that's one reason it doesn't comply with policy RE6. And then you also need to look at the Greenback policy, which looks at whether this is a proportionate addition to the building and they've looked at the original building and looked at the increase in volume, which this extension would add and concluded that that would be disproportionate. So it's inappropriate in, in the green belt. Right, so just to clarify that uh, from what, just to summarize what you're, you're saying is that this is a, an application for a development in green belt and not the conversion of an existing farm building in your opinion. I think it would, yeah, it was lean towards the development rather than the conversion because the majority of it isn't being converted, it's being redeveloped. I think it'd be hard to argue it was simply a conversion. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of questions. I don't think anyone else got anything else in there at the moment, they chat. Uh, I just want to clarify, there are no special circumstances, um, although Councillor Butchers did say about um, identifying it for husband reuse in the future, but I'm right in thinking there are no special circumstances um, in with this um, application, is that correct? That's correct, yes. All right, I don't think, has anyone else got any questions? Unless anyone else can type anything in quickly. Nope. Yeah, Councillor Jackson then. 
sorry, I wasn't quick enough off the mark. I mean, I understood both Councillor Butters and the applicant to say what unfortunately they did not put in writing, I presume, in the application, um, that having this dwelling here would much assist the, the farming uh, of the land, that it was going to be actively associated with the farming, although it's not down as a farm workers property or even, uh, and they don't need to be there the whole year round. And the secondary argument from that was that being resident on the site would mean fewer journeys to the field, say during lambing time or whatever the circumstances would be. So I don't know, Do can, are we able to take that into account as uh, exceptional circumstances? I think we have to take with what's in front of us, but I'm sure we will be corrected by the officers. I think we have to deal with an application as it stands in front of us. But I'm sure one of the officers will make sure we get it right. Chris or Tessa? Uh, yeah, that's correct. You need to deal with kind of what's in front of you today. In terms of whether a development for is acceptable for an agricultural worker, there are specific tests for that and they haven't kind of gone through those tests. So I would give that limited weight because the policy is specific in saying an essential worker and there needs to meet kind of functional tests to comply with that exception. Thank you. So I don't think there's any other questions for Councillor Rigby. You're happy to speak in the debate. So I'll start with you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I, uh, I'm not about to propose anything. I am just going to say where my, my thought process is to kick the debate off. Um, I, I am struggling to see what the counterbalancing exceptional circumstances are um, in terms of this is not, um, I mean, passive house technology is brilliant, but it's not entirely cutting edge. Um, and I think it was accepted that the straw bale side uh, isn't cutting edge. So I, I wouldn't be, I, I am struggling to think what the exceptional circumstances would be. H however, um, given the support of the parish councils and everybody local, and given the fact that my understanding is that this is going to be incredibly difficult to, to be seen anyway, um, I, I just wonder whether or not, and obviously I'll listen to the debate and, and, and uh, hear what my colleagues have said, I just wonder how far we could go down the route of saying, uh, in order to protect an element of our heritage and to keep it in uh, in use, how far that could be an exceptional circumstance. Because brutally honestly, if the choice is between leaving it to go to rack and ruin or, or doing something that protects it for future use, I normally go on the protect it for future use side, but I don't believe that that's necessarily a planning reason to overturn the officer's recommendation. So that's where my thought process is now, and I look forward to hearing what everyone else has to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Craig. Thank you, Chair. So, uh, yeah, ditto. I'm, I want to listen to what people have to say. My feelings at the moment, um, I think there is a presumption in favour of converting agricultural buildings. Um, this keeps the building protected and adds to the housing stock. Um, so I would say that's optimal use of a heritage asset um, and it keeps the family local uh, so I'm from my point of view I think those are all real pluses I and mean, if this was in a position which is why I asked about the, the aspect if this was in a position where it really did um, stick out like a sore thumb then you know I'm, I would be a definite no it shouldn't be done but I, I really don't feel like that at the moment I, I'm, I understand that the officer is absolutely you know, done a good report and it's um, within policy, um, but I think those are exceptional circumstances from my point of view. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, Craig. Councillor McPhee? I support the first two uh, speakers there. I thought uh, Councillor Butters made a very good point. Uh, you know, he I visited the site or tried to visit the site and it's very difficult to see anything at all from the road, that's for sure. The councils, all the neighbours are in favour. Uh, a point that was made that the ecologists saw a net gain as well as the uh, benefit to the farming. So it just seems that uh, we, we have a large number of very positive aspects of this 
which if you add them all together, we may consider exceptional. Thank you, uh, Councillor Hounsall. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, it, it's extremely important that we don't address planning applications uh, uh, in, a, in a piecemeal individual way. And we have to be led by the policies that we have, because if we undermine our policies, we, we just store up problems for ourselves uh, going forward. Uh, and the, the general public won't have any idea of what, what would be approved and, uh, and what wouldn't be approved. And the, the, the case officer made it very clear that we're not talking about the conversion of an existing farm building. Uh, it was made very clear we're talking about a development in, in Green Belt. And openness in Green Belt is not a, just about the views. It's been uh, made clear to us by officers in the past in previous uh, planning applications we've looked at that uh, um, just the location of something being in, in Green Belt is enough uh, to uh, uh, go against uh, uh, openness. It's not, not just about views. Um, this is development. Development is by definition harmful in Green Belt. Uh, that's the national planning policy, that's the local planning policy. So this is harmful and the only mitigation is exceptional circumstances and there have been no exceptional circumstances demonstrated. So although I've got a lot of sympathy uh, for this, this family and their need and, uh, 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 and their personal circumstances, et cetera, et cetera, and the, uh, you know, the local uh, people's sort of wishes, it, the policy says, this is harmful development in Greenbelt by definition, and there are no exceptional circumstances. Uh, and so I will be supporting the officer's recommendation to refuse. Uh, uh, not, uh, you know, not with a happy heart, but just because that's what the policy dictates. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and as you say, it's not for us to write the uh, special circumstances. We have to look at what's in front of us. Um, uh, Councillor, Clark? Yeah, um, once again, I find that the speaker uh, just in front of me has made a lot of comments uh, that um, I would like to make. So I do endorse what Councillor Duncan Council has just said. Um, I have a lot of um, empathy, as it were, with regard to uh, the Druids and what they would like to do. Uh, but um, I do think we do have a, a green belt policy. I do think this is a development within the uh, 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 green belt. And frankly, given the choice between uh, maintaining the green belt or maintaining an old barn, um, I, I would maintain the green belt. Um, so um, reluctantly in some ways, uh, but nevertheless, uh, I do believe the green belt policy should be adhered to. It's under a lot of pressure. I don't think we should be piecemeal in allowing the development of it, particularly when there's no exceptional circumstances. So I will be supporting the officer's recommendation. Thank you. I haven't actually got a proposal on the table yet either way, but uh, we'll keep going. Uh, Councillor Jackson. I'm afraid I'm really struggling with this one, Chair, because I can't quite see why this is not a conversion of an agricultural existing building. And the uh, degree of increase of built structure is well within the limits that's allowed for the green belt, as I understand it, though I admit my maths are rather dodgy. Um, why is this being treated as a new development when it plainly isn't? Um, it's a change of use, of course, because this was historically a barn, and now there's going to be a young family living there. Um, and secondly, uh, We've heard from um, a councillor who's visited the site and from uh, Councillor Butters who knows the site well and the parish council. This does not actually literally impact on the green belt. Um, it's hardly, it's not very visible and the only amount that is visible is the historic stone gable which you want to keep preserved rather than just to put it very bluntly, leaving it to the bats. So I wonder if we could, if I could be convinced that this is a new building somehow, because I, I don't see it as that, I see it as a conversion. And frankly, if the committee is going to turn this one down, 
uh, on a matter of dogma, I will suggest they go and buy a herd of alpacas um, where they would need to be local to look after alpacas, um, but you'd still have the same impact on the green belt. So I'm sorry about this, I'm thoroughly confused. Thank you. I think uh, Chris wants to come in and speak, but I don't know if you want to do speak before. Um, I've got Councillor Hodge and then Councillor Hughes. So should we take Chris after that? So Councillor Hodge first and then Councillor Hughes. Yeah, I, just, I mean, I have to say, again, it's very, very difficult. And But on the balance, I, I feel similar to um, Councillor Hounsell um, and Clark that we have this um, Greenbelt policy and it, specifically on volume. And I, I know we didn't ask questions on volume, but we, we did ask them to re-go back and check the calculations. And, you know, you, you could quibble the detail of them, but they do feel that it's almost 100% increase in volume and 91% increase uh, going from something that's about 142 to an overall structure that's about 340 cubic meters. And I think we're going to be in a dis difficult position. We have a lot of applications similar to this where we're looking at much smaller percentages and, and saying developments can't go ahead that, with other circumstances. And I, um, you know, we have, we have this policy with a measurement and I, I, I feel we probably have to, to stick with it and that there aren't particularly special circumstances. It's my view at the moment, but interesting. Thank you. Um, I've got Councillor Hughes and then we'll go to Chris and then I think Chris, Rob's going to come with a, a proposal. Thank you. I mean, I, I, I think, I mean, first of all, I would probably question the, the comment earlier about we shouldn't be undermining our policies when we've on the previous application we've undermined our own parking policy so i'm guessing there must be some flexibility in here <laughs> um i just think it's it's nice to see a building a derelict building being repurposed by what appears to be a long-standing local family to create a family home so um so i'm i'm in favor of this this development thank you thank you chris Thank you, Chair. I, I just wanted to uh, clarify the policy uh, situation. Um, just to clarify, there is there is no objection in principle to the conversion of this building. The, the issue is this particular scheme that's on the table and, and the impacts that it has and, and, and the ways in which it conflicts with policy RE6 uh, and Greenbelt policy. Um, with, with barn conversions, the starting point really is that new dwellings in the open countryside are not supported, um, uh, except in very exceptional circumstances. One such exceptional circumstance is, is barn conversions. Um, and the reason for that really is that in policy terms, the, the benefits of retaining and, and converting um, a nice old barn is, is judged to, to outweigh the wider countryside protection and, and sustainability policies, which seek to uh, avoid new dwellings in the countryside. Uh, in isolated locations, so so that that's why we have a policy that supports barn conversions. But I but I think I think that the important thing is that the policy supports barn conversions. It doesn't support the conversion of barns and some very substantial extensions to them as well, because that would conflict with the wider countryside protection policies. So in ter in terms of this particular application, um, the proposal does involve the conversion of what's there, but it also um, in terms of the, the stone building, but it also involve, involves a very large extension, which, it, which is explicitly contrary to policy RE6. There's also a design issue in terms of that, that extension is, is not felt to be of an acceptable or appropriate design. And that extension uh, will, 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 well, it, it will have a materially greater impact on the green belt than, than what's there currently. It will harm visual amenity, but also that, that extension because of its design um, will cause harm to a non-designated heritage asset and the conservation officer has said that the proposal isn't acceptable in its current form. So all of those things uh, together have, have, have result in the proposal being contrary to policy and, and harmful to that non-designated heritage as asset and as the case officer says in, in the report the, the, the benefits of the proposal um, do not outweigh that harm and, and, and hence 
officers have recommended refusal. So, so, so that's the situation really from, from an officer's point of view. So it, it is contrary to policy, but as with the previous application, of course, it is within the committee's gift to, to grant permission as a departure if there are material considerations uh, which outweigh uh, with those policies. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And so, Councillor Appleyard, I believe you have a proposal for us. Yeah, I mean, I think Chris has just summed it up there, really. I mean, we've been concentrated on whether, uh, uh, you know, whether it's inappropriate development or whether it's not inappropriate development. But actually, if we read the recommendation from the officer, there are reasons why uh, this is not an appropriate development and about, uh, uh, about the issue of the, its design and its effect and everything like this. I'm not going to add any more to what Chris has just said. Is other than to say that uh, I propose that we are, we follow the officer's recommendation in this case, it can come back in a, in another way with with, uh, with with the comments taken on board. Thank you very much. That needs a, a seconder, please. Okay. I'll second that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hounsall. And I can see Councillor Clark also put his hand up. So Councillor Hounsall. Um, is there anyone else who wishes to debate this further? There's nothing in the chat box. I can't see any hands. I'm going to quick glance around. Right. In that case, then, we'll go to the um, vote. So it's to accept the officer's recommendation as printed in the papers before us. And I'll go through um, in alphabetical order. So, Councillor Appleyard? For. Councillor Clark? For. Councillor Craig? Against. Okay. Myself? For. Councillor Hodge? For. Councillor Hounsell? For. Councillor Hughes. Against. Councillor Jackson. Abstain. Councillor McPhee. Against. And Councillor Rigby. Against. Okay, Marie, I'll ask you to give us the figures again. I didn't count them. I'll do a mat and didn't count them. <laughs> Sorry, that's five votes in favour, four votes against and one abstention. So that's carried. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you to the speakers who came in. And I think they're about to leave us, um, nearly at the end. So just one little thing on policy development. You may have noticed on the information that comes through from the LGIU last week, um, it highlighted a number of changes to, to permitted development rules um, and with new measures on the way. So officers will be providing a comprehensive summary of these changes at a future meeting. OK. Um, also, uh, appeals report, please have a look at uh, the appeals. Are there any questions on any, any of that? Can't see anyone. Councillor McPhee? <clears throat> Did I see that the um, appeal against the place in Clutton that we uh, turned down where we thought it was a, a dangerous place to, to have car parking? Was that the one that was to, was allowed through? Have you looked at it? Um, pitch by paper, have a look. Um, I didn't think it was through yet, but um, I like looking at it. Chris, are you, are you aware that's three ways it was called? To which the answer is, I don't know. Um, sorry, Chair, I can't I, get to my paper quickly. I, I would have to look that one up if you bear with me. I can't get up quick enough. Uh, well, I'll follow it up anyway, because I thought that was very, uh, if it is that one, I'd really like to know what the inspector said. So uh, I'll look at it and come back at the next The bills that we decided. Um... It's in the ones that are not yet determined. Yes, it's, it's gone in for appeal. It's not determined yet. I, I, so I hadn't seen it come through to me. As ward um, councillor yet, I know it's in for appeal, but it hasn't. Thank you, Eleanor. So I hadn't seen it come through unless it's come through in the last short, very short space of time. Right. And I think linked to something in Clutton. I'm not sure if Simon or Chris are just going to give us a, a comment about it. Chris, is it you? As your your mic's off to do with um, the Marsh Lane injunction. Uh, yes, well, I can assist on that, Chair, if you like. Um, yeah, okay, Simon. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, members may be aware last year that, uh, that they made a resolution to pursue injunctive action against a youth, an unlawful use of land at uh, Clutton Marsh Lane. Oh, yeah. Um, it's just to update members that uh, 
that that issue has been delayed by the pandemic and lockdown and that's a separate email will follow to uh, update you on the latest uh, regarding that. Okay, uh, Councillor Jackson. Um, I expect the answer is going to be the same, but do we have we made any progress with Wells Square Westfield? This got as far as legal action. I, I don't know, sorry, Councillor Jackson. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that one. Right. Um, the current situation, so I can check in again. We can, um, I suppose, send if an you email to. If you wouldn't mind, because I sent an email, but I didn't get a, re a reply. So. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Any other bits? No? In that case, the next meeting is on the 5th of May, starting again at 11. It will be a virtual meeting. It's the day before it all runs out, I think, for virtual meetings. Just so happens planning was coincide with that day. So our next one will be a virtual meeting. There are no site visits. So and hopefully that will be back with us by then. So thank you all very much. Thank you. And thank you to the officers.